Hello, welcome, or welcome back to my channel. My name is Mar, and here I am to deliver another unnecessary video about the show Big Time Rush. If you haven't watched my first video, that is where I talk about seasons one and two of the show, as well as give you background information about the show. And I also go over their first two albums, as well as their concert tours. So if you haven't watched the show, or you don't know much about the show Big Time Rush, I highly suggest you go watch that first video. Otherwise, you will probably be confused watching this video. If you don't mind being clueless, by all means, continue watching this video. But today we are going to be covering Big Time Rush's movie titled Big Time Movie. We're also going to be talking about the crossovers they had with other Nickelodeon shows. And we will also cover seasons three and four of their actual TV show and then also go over the concert tours that they had. So yeah, we have a lot to talk about. Just a little reminder for the most part that I will be talking about Big Time Rush, mostly in the context of their TV show. If I'm talking about something outside of the context of the TV show, I will disclose it. In this video, there's going to be a bit more tea about stuff that happened behind the scenes of Big Time Rush. And all of that is public knowledge. Most of the stuff I got is just by Big Time Rush talking about it in interviews and all of that. So I will be sharing the stuff I learned. And without further ado, let's get started with this video. When I was creating this video, I was getting super lost on like where we were in the timeline. Just in the context of when they were in production for their TV show, when they were producing albums, when they were filming their TV show, when they were going on concert tours. So I pretty much decided to make a BTR timeline of what all that looked like. Hi, so I almost forgot to record this, but here is the Big Time Rush timeline spreadsheet that I created. I've sort of color categorized everything pretty much putting everything from the production of what seasons to when the seasons aired and then when they released their albums and then when they went on tour and all that. I started this sort of chart from September 2009. So into September 2009, that was when the first season started production. So that is when they filmed the pilot as well as the rest of the episodes. So they went from September 2009 and they filmed all the way till April 2010. And then season one aired, the first episode of the show aired in November of 2009. And then December, they didn't air any of the new episodes. And then finally in the new year, that's when the rest of season one started airing. And so um, the episodes aired from January all the way till August 2010. When the final couple episodes of the first season were airing, that's when they started production of season two of Big Time Rush. Um, if I'm not mistaken. So production started July 2010 and they pretty much filmed all the way until May 2011. And then, um, but season two pretty much started airing almost immediately after season one aired. So season two aired in September 2010 and then it was airing pretty much all the way until January of 2012. So it was airing for you know, more than a year, so 15 months or so, it was all of season two of Big Time Rush was airing, which is insane. After the first couple episodes of season two air, that is um, in October of 2010, that is when they released the Big Time Rush BTR debut album. They were filming the second season, and then finally in April, they started their Big Time Rush in concert tour. And they were pretty much touring from April 2011 all the way till, to se till December 2011. And then looking at the concert dates as well, you can see that they only had one concert in October. So I just guessed that they were probably starting production of the Big Time Movie and filming the Big Time Movie 
um, from October to November, and that's also just like what I guessed. Um, the production was based off of just articles that came out around the time. A lot of the articles that were coming out were from around the ends of October, early November, and all of that about the Big Time Rush movie. And then during this time as well, they also released Elevate, their second album, um, in November of 2011. And then they finished off the Big Time Russian concert tour, and then the final couple episodes of season two were airing, and then right after that, they went on the Better With You tour, so that was the One Direction tour, and they went on that tour from February to March of 2012, and the tour ended um, on the same day that the Big Time movie premiere happened, or the big t when the Big Time movie movie was released. Then pretty much right after they finished their Better With You tour, that is when they started production on season three. So season three production happened from April 2012 to July 2012, I would assume. Um, those dates aren't super clear, but I would I assume that it's it happened right after their tour and right before they started their new tour. A month after they started production on this their show, the episode started airing. So season three started airing from May 2012 all the way till November 2012. When they finished production, they went on the big time summer tour. So I'll get to that later on. I'll get to the rest of this stuff later on in my video, but there was the big time summer tour. And then after, so the big time summer tour was July to October. And then they had maybe a couple months of break and then they immediately went into production for season four in January of 2013. And that was filmed from January all the way up until May of 2013. And then right as they finished production, they aired the show. And then during that time in June of 2013, that was when they released the 24-7 album. So that was their third album that they released. And then right when they released the album, that's when they went on their um, summer break tour. So that was the Victoria Justice tour. So they went on tour from June to August of 2013. And then they went on a little break. And then in February 2014, they went on another tour for the month of February called the Live World Tour. And then the rest of the time was a hiatus up until 2021 when they decided to reunite. So yeah, that is the Big Time Rush timeline. Hopefully this makes things more clear now on like when things happened and all that because for me, I was getting super confused on like when they were filming things, when they were touring and all that. So this is a nice little visual for us visual people. And yeah, let's get back to the video of me summarizing the plots to this insane show. So now that we got the timeline out of the way, I hope that cleared things up for some of you. The first thing we are going to be talking about is the big time movie. The big time movie chronologically takes off almost immediately after the second season. So in the big time movie, we have Kendall, James, Carlos, and Logan heading off to London to start off their first big world tour, the all over again world tour. But instead, they end up getting mixed up in this mission where they have to save the world because God forbid that we just have a normal 3D concert movie or whatever. No, we had to make this movie a spy movie, you know, for the 11 year old demographic. So I never watched this movie when it aired. I don't know why. I feel like it's just because maybe I didn't have access to Nickelodeon at the time. So I never watched this when it aired. I could never find it online as a kid. So I didn't get to watch this movie. So the first time I watched this movie was when I had COVID a couple months ago and I was like sick in bed. And since I watched this movie as an adult, I don't have any nostalgic attachment to this movie. So I'm I'm going to be honest, <laughs> this movie is genuinely bad. Like, it's not good. And it's like not even the boys' fault either. Like, they were really good in this movie. Their acting was fine. But like, just everything else about it was bad. I wasn't even sure if I wanted to do a full recap of this movie either, because I just didn't like it that much, but I decided that I would do it for the people who haven't watched this movie. And so, yeah, this movie is also only like 
a bit longer than an hour. So that's pretty much equivalent to around three Big Time Rush episodes anyways. The recapping this is not a tedious task at all. Even though this movie takes place in London, this movie was fully filmed in Vancouver. I'm Canadian, so I know what Vancouver looks like. I know where they were filming this movie. We know that Nickelodeon was not going to spend a dime to fly the cast out to London to actually film this movie. And it's also just cheaper to film in Canada, from what I've heard. They probably just had no money left to spend because they had to buy the rights to the Beatles discography. So... Because of the fact that this is filmed in Canada, the British accents in this film are just horrendous. You can kind of hear the Canadian accent behind a lot of the cast. When you film a movie or TV show, usually in Canada, there's sort of like a quota for how many Canadian actors versus how many international actors you can have on a set. So obviously, since everyone on Big Time Rush or most of the cast is is American. That fills up the international quota. They had to cast Canadian actors as British people. So you can just hear like there's something off in the British accents. It's really noticeable. Also, I have no idea if this movie is canon at all with the TV show because they never acknowledge it ever again in the TV show. So it's sort of like this is just a little side quest they have that they don't acknowledge. Also, I found this photo of One Direction attending the Big Time Rush movie premiere because I believe the premiere was like it happened right after the Better With You tour or something like that. The one the, the One Direction tour or whatever. So I don't know. I just find this photo like so funny because they all look genuinely happy to be there. Like, look at Harry. Like, there's not one thought in this man's mind. Like, he is just happy to be there. Like, look at all the hope and, like, wonder they have in their eyes still. Because I believe this happened, like, right when One Direction was getting off of, like, the X Factor. Or I think maybe it was, like, a year after X Factor. So they were still pretty much rising up in fame and all that. But, yeah, it's like, they all look so innocent in this in this picture before things really went to shit. Now let's get started on the actual plot summary of this movie. The movie starts with Carlos, Logan, Kendall, and James. Having all having these like super cool spy like entrances while singing a cover of the song Help by the Beatles. I also forgot to mention that this whole movie pays homage to the group The Beatles because I think in every single boy band contract, they always have to do something Beatles related. So in Big Time Rush's case, they did a whole movie. And throughout the movie, they pretty much sing covers of songs by the Beatles. And there are many references to the Beatles as well. If I watched this as a kid, I think a lot of the references would actually just fly over my head. Because unless you live in Europe, or you have white parents, most kids don't know a lot about who the Beatles are. My parents weren't Beatles fans, so pretty much everything I've learned about the Beatles is just through like pop culture and social media. The film pretty much begins with Big Time Rush as this group of secret agent super spies who are working together to save this princess from the clutches of this evil mastermind guy in a white suit who plans to like leech codes from her to activate Britain's supply of nuclear bombs so he can rule the world. Um, Yeah, pretty much they defeat the villain and they rescue her. It is then actually revealed that this mission was just a dream Carlos was having. And in reality, the boys are actually on a plane to London to start their world tour. So on the plane, they reveal that Carlos has frequent dreams of becoming a spy, something that Logan claims is just preposterous. Meanwhile, James has this desire to fall in love on their tour or something like that. I don't know. On the plane, Gustavo and Kelly, they just wish that this tour will go well, but Gustavo is nervous because he thinks the boys are going to mess it up. Meanwhile, Katie has plans on becoming a princess in England. They finally arrive in London, and to make sure that Big Time Rush don't mess up this tour, Kelly and Gustavo hired consultants to write up a strategy report titled Do Nothing and Nothing Can Go Wrong. And it has a detailed schedule of 
and list of what the boys are allowed and not allowed to do while they are on tour. The film switches to view this unnamed man pretty much running through the airport and fleeing from airport security officials. And he's carrying this very uh, mysterious and girly backpack with him. And pretty much the man runs into Big Time Rush when he's fleeing and the police follow him and they also run into Big Time Rush. And pretty much um, the man is nearly cornered by airport security when he gets to the baggage claim and he sees a conveniently sees a similar bag to what he's holding and he switches the bags out. He is soon captured and knocked out by this man who has a metal arm or hand. Apparently, this is also a reference to a Beatles song. Would not be able to tell you. I don't have that knowledge. The only person that sees the men leaving the airport is Carlos. This dude is pretty much taken to the home of a millionaire businessman named Sir Atticus Moon. And pretty much he desires this device that is stored in the backpack that this guy was carrying. And he wants to use it to conquer the world because why not? He discovers that the agent switched the bags, and so he orders his henchmen to move out and find the true backpack. The boys arrive at their hotel, and it is revealed that the backpack that the agent switched out was actually Kendall's backpack. And this backpack was sent to Kendall by one of his fans, so that's why he uses it, despite that the other boys in the band hate it, because it looks girly and ugly. Gustavo and Kelly pretty much tell the boys to wait in the lobby while they check in. Meanwhile, MI6 agents learn that Kendall has the backpack with the device and they are pretty much trying to take it from him. So while the boys are waiting for Gustavo and Kelly to check them in to the hotel, they unintentionally take down multiple MI6 agents who are trying to take the backpack and they don't even realize that they are taking down these agents. Meanwhile, Katie overhears this old guy saying that he's a duke and he's staying at the same hotel as them. So the boys are finally checked into the hotel and they pretty much learn that they are staying in this expensive and luxurious suite. However, due to Gustavo and Kelly's strategy report, they're not allowed to leave their hotel room. So the boys begin unpacking and Kendall discovers that the bag he has is not his bag, and it contains this weird bug-like looking mechanism robot thingy in it, and this is the device that Sir Atticus Moon is trying to go after because we have to make that very clear. He wants this bug-looking device. He takes it out of the case, and pretty much the boys encourage Kendall to turn it on. So Kendall switches the device on, and it pretty much causes the entire room to become engulfed in anti-gravity, which makes the guys float up to the ceiling and make a mess in the room. And then they tell Kendall to switch the bug off and he switches it off and everything falls to the floor. So the guys are now terrified of this device and don't know what it is. And then immediately afterwards, an MI6 agent breaks into their hotel room and demands boys to surrender this device to him. And in the scene, he's like, no funny business. And James responds, don't worry, we're actually quite sad. I just thought that was a great scene. I don't know. It's like, James has great delivery. The actual movie itself, Not good, but the delivery of lines by the guys, really great. The agent shoots Logan with a tranquilizer dart and Logan gets knocked out. And that is a reoccurring gag throughout this whole movie. After that, this young, attractive girl breaks through the window of the room and she pretty much takes the agent down and grabs the backpack. James immediately falls in love with this girl. But then... Two secret agents from Sweden break into the room and knock the girl out, and then they demand the backpack. Also, fun fact, this guy right here, he went to the same high school as my mother. This is not also like this isn't a flex or anything like I don't know this guy. I've never met him in my life, but it's just he was in so many movies I watched growing up as a kid, and he has such a distinct look that every time I see him, I just have to point it out. So anyways, the boys end up escaping the hotel through the window, and they have to drag an unconscious Logan with them. 
Meanwhile, Katie is trying to convince her mom to go on a date with this Duke. Back in Kelly and Gustavo's plot, Kelly and Gustavo meet with this tour promoter, which they're trying to introduce the guys to. However, when they get to the boys' room, they find everything trashed and broken, and they realize that their strategy report is not going to work with Big Time Rush. We get to MI6 British Intelligence Headquarters, and it is revealed that the man who swapped Kendall's bag is a secret agent named Simon Lane, who the MI6 believes has gone rogue, and they pretty much zero in on Big Time Rush, believing that they are also suspects and want to take over the world. So Big Time Rush flee to Chinatown wearing these interesting disguises and they are pretty much trying to figure out like what is happening to them and on this weird public computer thing they learn about who moon is and that the device that they have has something to do with anti-gravity and he created it and pretty much they are ambushed by other spies once again how they're finding these guys I don't know. They run through the back alleys of Chinatown and try to escape from them. And they run into the female spine that broke into their hotel room. And she tells the boys to get into her spy van. Also, during the scene, the song Can't Buy Me Love plays. Miss Girlie helps the boys escape from the other spies in her AI and her We learn that her AI-powered van is really rude. In this scene, she pretty much explains to the guys who she is. Also, she makes Kendall grab the wheel and drive in this scene. So that just now proves that all of the Big Time Rush members have their driver's license. Because in the show, it was only Logan who had his learners. And then he got his driver's. So I'm guessing somewhere they got their driver's license. And also... How are you supposed to make me believe that these guys are in London when Kendall is literally driving on the wrong side of the road? First off, the steering wheel is on the left side of the car and Kendall is driving on the right side of the road. Anyway, so pretty much Miss Girlie tells the guys that her name is Penny Lane and she is Agent Simon Lane's daughter. And she reveals that the device that the boys have is called the Beetle and it's an anti-gravitational device that has enormous power. So yeah, like the, the Beatles references are really in your face in this movie. So Penny wants to exchange the Beetle for an order to free her father but then she also has a plan that during the exchange she's going to stop moon before he has a chance to get it from them the boys then learn that they are wanted criminals by everyone since they are wanted criminals they can't go to the police and pretty much they agree to help penny as long as she helps them clear everything up and also help them get to their sound check on time. In the scene, they're almost ambushed by the police, but Kendall uses the beetle to help them escape and their car floats across London. Meanwhile, the MI6 are trying to find as much information they can about Big Time Rush, and they pretty much watch footage from their hotel room in which Gustavo claims that Big Time Rush will soon crush London and conquer the rest of Europe and rule the world. And Gustavo in the scene was referring to the success of their upcoming world tour. However, the MI6 take his threats literally and think that he is going to like dominate the world. Before Big Time Russia's sound check, Kelly and Gustavo are waiting for Big Time Rush to show up, and at their sound check, MI6 agents knock them out. Katie is at high tea with Mrs. Knight, and she tells Mrs. Knight that if she marries the Duke, Katie will be a princess, and therefore she will have a better chance at dating Prince Harry after he's tired of his bachelor ways. The boys are trying to figure out how to get to their sound check, and so Penny pretty much gets them to wear different disguises. Carlos is a bachelor bad boy or something. James is a hippie. Kendall is a jogger with very long hair. And Logan is in a dog mascot costume. They're trying to get into Hyde Park without any of them recognizing that they are big time rush. Also, they sing the song We Can Work It Out. And I think they're making references to the Beatles music video, but I can't be sure. I just could not be bothered to search it up on my own. Their disguises don't work as well as they think. And so pretty much 
the scene ends with the members being chased to their sound check. They make it to their sound check, all right, and they finish singing the song, We Can Work It Out. Their sound check is cut short after a bunch of screaming fangirls chase them off stage, and Penny has to help them escape. And then the boys and Penny go and meet Moon t- to get her father back. Before we get into the next part of this movie, I think we need to talk about James's wardrobe for this movie. During the time that this movie was filmed, Big Time Rush was just coming off of one of their concert tours. And so obviously at this time, they were really fit and they were probably working out a lot because as you can tell, the boys just look a lot bigger in this this movie compared to like when they were filming the other seasons for their show. They physically grew a lot. And since they last filmed the TV show, they just look a lot older when you see them. So whatever James is wearing in this movie, I think is just their attempt to make James look a lot younger because again, like he's a six foot tall, 17 year old in this film or whatever. It just doesn't work. Like, what is this? Like, what, what is he wearing? This long sleeve t-shirt, fashion thing whatever it's just not doing it for me like just put him this man in a hoodie or a, like a graphic tee or something like that's all you need to do to make him look young speaking of their fashion you i think you most people notice that each bo- each of the boys kind of have their own look or like they wear specific things for their characters so like kendall he's always wearing like a lot of plaid stripes checkered patterns and all that throughout the show Logan wears a lot of vests and a lot of sweaters and Carlos is usually wearing either a t-shirt or like a hoodie and James usually wears just like t-shirts sometimes with a leather jacket like I don't know like the James's wardrobe is like the most inconsistent in the whole show sorry I just needed to take time to stop and reevaluate their fashion now we're going to continue with the plot summary Their plan doesn't go as expected. Penny gets caught by metal arm guy. And Logan is, again, knocked out with a trank dart. However, they do end up escaping Moon and his henchmen. The boys escape with the help of, again, Penny and Agent Lane. And they pretty much take them to the M- an MI6 like secret headquarters or something, which they enter through a public toilet. In the scene, Lane reassures them that he's just like, once he returns to the MI6 and proves that he is innocent and didn't go rogue and gets the beetle to the MI6's head, hands um he will be able to fix the mess that they are in however when he's preparing to leave logan accidentally shoots him with a trank dart disguised as a pen which according to penny will last 12 hours so he's going to be knocked out for 12 hours and pretty much logan is having a bad day meanwhile gustavo and kelly are also having a bad day as they are being tortured by the mi6 and this includes them being trapped in a room with a man karaokeing to Big Time Rush's songs really badly. Meanwhile, Miss Jennifer Knight is getting ready to go on a date with the Duke. However, Katie discovers after watching a commercial on TV that the Duke is actually just a toilet salesman. And so Katie now has to stop her mother from going on this date. But before she can inform her mother that the Duke is actually just a salesman, she is kidnapped by Moon and Metal Hammer Guy, and she is taken to his mansion. So now at the secret headquarters, the guys are trying to figure out what to do, and Moon sends a message to Big Time Rush demanding the Beetle and reveals to them that he has Katie. Carlos then realizes that his dream has come true and that Katie is the princess that they have to save. So now Kendall is freaking out because they took his sister and Penny just reassures him that, you know, they can save his sister in time because they have the beetle like everything is in their favor right now things don't go as planned as the beetle accidentally ends up in one of moon moon's trucks after 
Logan accidentally gives the backpack away and Logan again claims that he's having a really bad day. So back in Kelly and Gustavo's plot, the MI6 then talk to Gustavo and Kelly again and realize that they were wrong and neither them nor Big Time Rush are a threat. And so they drop them off in the middle of a sheep farm. And then back at Moon's castle, Moon reveals his plans to use the beetle's anti-gravity powers to knock the moon off of its orbit, therefore triggering a multitude of natural disasters on Earth that would force its leaders to surrender to him. Which actually isn't a horrible plan. I can suspend disbelief for Everything else I can't suspend this really for, but that, you know, I'm like, okay, that, that checks out. The boys and Penny realize that they pretty much have limited options in what they can do. They ultimately decide to use the events of Carlos's dream as a guide to, on what to do because his dreams have been correct so far. Penny's spy van picks her and the guys up. They plan on going to Moon's mansion to save Katie while dressed in tuxedos. Meanwhile, Jennifer goes on the date with a duke and he gives her a bouquet of toilet plants. Plungers. Moon is starting his plan to take over the moon and everyone is stressed because he has this weird laser thing going on. The boys manage to make it to Moon's mansion on time and they crash through his gates with their spy van. And yeah, just as the moon is about to align itself with Moon's laser, the boys and Penny arrive. Carlos and Logan help to beat up the guards while K Kendall works to free Katie. And during the scene, the song Revolution plays in the background. Moon projects a force field around himself and he activates the laser thingy, which now he initiates his plan to take over the moon. James, with a helpful kiss from Penny, finds the courage to fall on top of Moon from a balcony above him. And because of that, they are able to deactivate the laser and the world is saved. Moon flees outside with Katie in a last attempt to recover his plans and he demands the beetle from the guys and realizing kendall realizing that he has to save his sister he reluctantly tosses the beetle to moon however when he tosses the beetle to moon he activates it and just before moon catches it katie stomps on his foot which causes him to hunch over and the beetle attaches itself onto his back Instead, it causes him to slowly lift up in the sky due to the anti-gravitational force power thingy. Kendall is happily reunited with Katie. Meanwhile, Moon is flying off into space and orbit wherever the hell he ends up. So the MI6 agents arrive and learn of the band's innocence after they torture Gustavo and Kelly for multiple hours. In exchange for the voice saving the world, the agents agree to give them a lift to their concert in a helicopter. So the boys arrive at their concert from a helicopter as the tour manager is just about to cancel their entire world tour. And they open the show by performing a cover of the song A Hard Day's Night. Gustavo and Kelly manage to arrive at the concert and they are relieved that the guys saved the world tour. After they perform A Hard Day's Night, they then go into performing their song Elevate. Elevate a little higher and throw a party at the sky and celebrate which is also the title of their album, Elevate. Meanwhile, Moon is still floating in the sky and cursing Big Time Rush. And then the boys pretty much perform a successful concert, and that makes Kelly and Gustavo very happy, and they allow the boys to explore the city for a couple hours. And Mrs. Knight calls it off with the Duke after she says that she hates toilets. The boys prepare to leave to tour London, for the night, their tour guides are revealed to be two Swedish spies who ambushed them earlier, and these spies request that Big Time Rush have a concert in Sweden on the world tour, and then they drive off, and they also give Kendall his backpack back. And then Penny pulls up with her father, who has now regained consciousness, and they offer to give them a tour around the city, provided that they make a few stops along the way. And yeah, the boys pile in to the van with Penny and James and Penny share a quick smile before the door closes and they drive off. And that is the end of the movie. If you can tell by Mr. Spy Van's 
license plate. Yeah, that is the end of the big time movie. So if you forgot the plot, the characters, the songs, anything that happens in this movie, don't worry about it because we will never hear about any of this again. This movie is never acknowledged in the show. And again, I don't blame them for not adding references because, yeah, like the show itself, like the TV show, it's crazy in itself. But this whole movie is just a whole other level of crazy and insane that it's like, I don't even think like they could tie anything from the movie into the show and make it, you know, believable enough. They released an album that pretty much contains all of their covers of the Beatles songs. And so you can go check that out on streaming platforms. You usually don't count the Big Time Rush movie as like an extra album of theirs because like none of them are Big Time Rush songs or anything like that. That is a Big Time Rush movie. You don't have to watch this movie at all to understand what's going on in the TV show. Again, like I never watched this movie and I was completely fine. Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about is season three of the show. And season three aired between the dates of May 12th, 2012 to November 10th, 2012. And it consists of 12 episodes in total. So a lot less than last season. It has a total of 12 episodes, but 14 episodes if you include the crossovers again. And also this season doesn't have any one hour specials like the previous seasons do. But technically, if you include the big time movie, then I guess that would count as an hour long special. There's a reason why this season is much shorter. They just filmed a lot of other content on the side of season three. The first thing we are going to talk about, the first episode we are going to talk about is actually a crossover episode. And that is how to rock an election, and there is their crossover with the TV show How to Rock on Nickelodeon. This TV show wasn't as popular as like the other TV shows they had at the time, and iCarly and all that, but they went with How to Rock. And in this episode, the main character, Casey Simon, played by Miss Queen, Miss Symphonique Miller, who appeared in the previous season of Big Time Rush, she plays a completely different character. She is running against her rival, Molly, for class president. Casey wants to win real badly, so she promises to the student body that she will get the band Big Time Rush to come and perform at their school. Casey goes to Big Time Rush's album signing, and she tries to convince them to come to her school to perform. The boys politely decline the invite. They're just like, we have no idea who you are, and no, we're not interested. And so Casey gets dragged out out of the album signing. Casey then tries to convince Big Time Rush again after their concert as she sneaks backstage to their dressing room. And pretty much the boys now think that she's crazy. And again, she gets dragged out of the room by security. At the end of the episode, Casey ends up losing class president to her friend Kevin. And during his celebration, Big Time Rush show up to the school to perform. And in the end, Big Time Rush, they say to Casey that they decided to make a special appearance at their party after what she told them. They performed the song Music Sounds Better With You, which they actually never performed on their actual TV show. And all I know is that Music Sounds Better With You, that song was probably a PR disaster for Nickelodeon because in the song, Kendall says the word hell. He says it in the song once. And for this episode, they literally had to censor it. Like, he wasn't allowed to sing it at all. The episode ends with Big Time Rush hanging out with Gravity 5 in their green room or something. I don't know. I don't know what they call this room. Like, just their, their hangout room that they have at the school. Yeah, they learn the band's handshake. So this is the second time that Symphonique Miller and Big Time Rush have worked together. And this is also the first crossover that Big Time Rush has with another Nickelodeon show. However... It is very confusing if Big Time Rush is playing themselves from their TV show. If it is them from their TV show, it makes sense because this might be part of their All Over the World Again tour, which starts with the Big Time Rush movie. And they pretty much, in this episode, they also reveal that they played in London. So this episode would chronologically go after a big time movie. And also in this episode, the Big Time Rush members retain their characters' personalities from their show. But it's just not acknowledged on like if this is Big Time Rush from their TV show or just Big Time Rush as themselves playing themselves from reality. They're in this weird territory where it's like you don't know if they're playing their characters or they're playing themselves. So 
The next episode we are going to talk about is Backstage Rush. So this is the first episode in season three. In this episode, it is the last concert of the All Over the World Again tour, and they are ending it in Toronto, Canada. In this episode, Big Time Rush are trying to beat NSYNC's backstage changing record so they can be on the Canada Center's Wall of Fame. Throughout this whole episode, Kendall and James are very determined to beat this record. However, Logan and Carlos are focused on other things. So Logan, he is trying to finish this book that he promised himself that he would finish by the end of their tour. Meanwhile, Carlos is being investigated by an investigator from France who believes that Carlos smuggled a cricket and Katie is trying to help Carlos hide this cricket from this investigator. Meanwhile, during the concert, Kelly is trying to warn Gustavo about the trampoline that they have on stage because it has been recalled due to faulty wielding. Unfortunately, Kelly gets locked out of the venue by security along with a bunch of other Big Time Rush fans, and she's trying to figure out a way to get back into the venue and warn Gustavo about this. I'm just going to say, Carlos's plot wraps up really quick. Cr- really quickly he gets to keep the crooked meanwhile logan finishes his book before they perform their last song of the night and the boys find the answer on how they can beat nsync's record it involves ripping the, their clothes off their bodies and yeah they managed to beat nsync's record and now they are on the hall of fame the boys then perform their song Elevate a little higher. And then while they perform Elevate, Kelly is holding up their trampoline on stage. And then the the episode ends with Big Time Rush successfully finishing up their world tour. This episode is kind of special because instead of the normal Big Time Rush theme song insert, you know, they actually perform the song live at their concert. And so some of the footage that is in this episode is from Big Time Rush's concert in Nashville, Tennessee for their Better With You tour. So that was on March 7th, 2012. And so in this episode, they incorporate some live performances and all that, which include the songs Blow Your Speakers, Love Me, Love Me, Famous, Time of Our Life, Boyfriend, This Is Our Someday, Cover Girl, City Is Ours, and of course, Elevate. So yeah. That is Backstage Rush. So the next episode we have is Big Time Returns. The guys are finally back home from their all over again world tour and they become celebrities at the Palmwoods Hotel. Bitters has created the Bitters Big Time Rush experience at the Palmwoods. This doesn't make it exactly easy for them to relax while they're at home. When they arrive, Kendall reveals that their hotel rooms were broken into 19 times during their tour. And then there are also some references to beginning of season two. So their first episode in season two, they return to the Palmwoods after their tour. However, nobody knows them. This one, they return home, except now everyone knows them and they can't get an ounce of privacy. In this episode, Logan wants to get back together with Camille. However, she won't make the first move. He enlists Katie to help him figure out why Camille won't make the first move. And it turns out that Buddha Bob is the one that has been giving Camille a dating advice. And Buddha Bob tells Camille to let Logan make the first move. At the end of the episode, they both decide to make the first move as of Katie's suggestion. And and they get back together in James's plot. So James is ready to ask Lucy out on a date. But Kendall informs James that before they left for their tour... Lucy winked at him. At the end of season two, Lucy winks at Kendall while they perform the song all over again at the Palmwoods. And so James brings up the rules of dibs to Kendall, and he claims that he dibs Lucy first. And if Kendall breaks the rules of dibs, he has to run through the Palmwoods in his underpants. The rule of dibs includes all car seating, remote controls, and game controllers, all found monies, tasty snacks and or treats, and girls. Any violation of said dibs rule will result in the violator having to run one half mile through a crowded public area in his underwear. James tries to 
kiss Lu- Lucy when he sees her at the Palm Woods. However, she runs away from him and she ends up running into Kendall. Lucy tries to talk to Kendall about the tour and James finds out and about this and confronts Kendall about it. When Lucy comes back to talk to Kendall, Kendall refuses to talk to Lucy and Lucy gets mad at Kendall for blowing her off and Kendall says to her that James has dibs on her. Lucy is offended that they placed dibs on her, so in retaliation, Lucy dibs as Kendall by telling other girls not to look at him or talk to him, and she also kisses him on the cheek, which makes James very angry. Yeah, Lucy confronts Kendall about the word dibs, and he's, she's just like, do you know where that comes from? Do I look like a cow to you? She's such a queen for that. As a running gag in this episode, Kendall is forced to run through the palm woods in his underwear multiple times. And then Kendall has finally had enough of running through the palm woods in his underwear. So Kendall and James apologize to Lucy. And Lucy accepts and undibs as Kendall and explains to James that she's just not interested in him. And Lucy walks away from them. And before she leaves, she winks at Kendall, confirming that she still might have a thing for him. And now we get into Carlos's plot. Griffin kidnaps Carlos and he is pressuring Carlos to pick one of their songs to perform at a radio interview with Jojo Wright. And pretty much Griffin wants to promote the song Love Me, Love Me. Meanwhile, Gustavo wants them to promote Elevate. At the end of the episode, Carlos ends up picking Big Time Rush's newest song windows down to play on jojo Wright's radio station and in the episode they play the music video for windows down which is pretty much similar to the one that they posted online on youtube it just contains clips that they filmed in hawaii pretty much and jojo likes it and he tells them that this is going to be a hit so yeah also if you don't know who jojo Wright is jojo Wright, he's like a well-known radio personality and host in los angeles i don't think you would know that if you're not from America. The boys celebrate at the end of the episode by eating the desserts that they dibbed in the seventh grade. However, Katie tells them that they are eating the wrong ones. All of them are forced to run through the palm woods in their underwear and they decide to get rid of the rolls of dibs altogether. The next episode we have is Bel Air Rush. Since Big Time Rush are now insanely popular, the paparazzi and crazy fans start driving Big Time Rush insane while they are living at the Palm Woods. And in this episode, Rachel Crow guest stars as a fan named Winnie. And Rachel Crow is a person in such a moment of time. Like, if you don't know who she is, she was on The X Factor. When The X Factor was a show that actually still made people popular, Girlie was just doing like guest star gigs and all of that like i genuinely forgot about her until she showed up in this episode because of their popularity and that you know living at the palm woods just isn't safe for them now gustavo is forced to move the guys to a mansion which he reveals to be in bel air i forgot to mention this in my first video but big time rush's living situation confuses me in the sense that like what is their rooming situation like at the palm woods like do they all share a room does Mrs. Knight and sh- and Katie share a bedroom? Meanwhile, like the rest of the boys sleep in the same room or like, do they have, do they all have their own rooms? Like, what is the rooming situation like? Like none of this was clear in the show because we've never seen their bedrooms ever. So what, what is it? Like, what is their rooming situation like? Like that is one of the biggest questions I have about this show. Next scene, a bunch of white boys and a Latino sing moving up to bel-air which is a parody of again the fresh prince of bel-air theme song moving up to bel-air moving up to bel-air they arrive at their new mansion in bel-air and they meet captain McAllister, who is bel-air's manager and block captain and he pretty much welcomes the boys and the knights to their neighborhood and he also tells them the strict rules that residents must follow so mr alfonso ribeiro who plays carlton on the fresh prince of bel air stars guest stars in this episode and also fun fact him and carlos had the same dance partner on dancing with the stars miss whitney carson i love whitney carson so that is why i had to add that fact the boys are happy that they don't have to deal with paparazzi or crazy fans at bel air however they soon soon start to get bored and meanwhile katie decides to start a lemonade stand in the neighborhood since bel air has one of the highest average incomes in los angeles even though gustavo was the one who bought 
Big Time Rush's mansion in Bel Air. Gustavo and Kelly are not allowed inside. And pretty much throughout this episode, they're trying to figure out how to get past the gates into Bel Air. Meanwhile, Mrs. Knight doesn't know how to use their home control system in the house and continuously keeps knocking herself out during this whole episode. Miss Katie, Miss Girl Boss, is trying to start her own lemonade stand, and she's selling lemonade for $20 a cup. And pretty much, she discovers that the lemons in her backyard belong to their neighbor, Fabio. Fabio is back, you guys. The boys are bored, and they start playing street hockey on the street, which leads them to setting off several alarms that their neighbors have put in place. So in order to not get in trouble, they run away only to run into their neighbor's backyard, and they learn that their neighbor has a pet tiger. So in the scene, the boys try to sing to the tiger, but they actually start to anger the tiger instead. And then Winnie appears and shoots the tiger with a tranquilizer dart, then tries to shoot the boys with the tranquilizer dart as well to take them home. Anyways, yeah, Big Time Rush then realize that Bel Air isn't what it seems, and they are pretty much trying to come up with a plan to escape. One of the plans includes digging a six-foot hole. They all want to go back to the palm woods. Gustavo and Kelly come up with a plan to get them out of Bel Air, so they end up breaking the gates down with their moving truck, and the boys start to load the truck with their stuff, and they decide to move back to the palm woods. Their neighbors then see them, and they try to stop them from moving out, but Winnie arrives and helps them escape by crashing into Captain McAllister. Fabio realizes that he also doesn't want to live in Bel Air, so he leaves with Big Time Rush in their truck. And this is Fabio's last appearance in the show. Big Time Rush returned to the Palmwoods and to their friends again. However, the paparazzi is soon knocked out by Winnie with her tranquilizer dart. And the boys thank her and are also terrified of her. That is Bel Air Rush. This is one of the episodes I remember watching a lot as a kid, and it, I think it still holds up to this day. We have probably one of my favorite episodes, and that is Big Time Double Date. This episode starts off with the boys walking into the Palmwoods lobby and seeing Logan and Camille fighting. So Logan tells the boys that Camille is mad at him because he suggested that they limit their dates to two nights a week. The boys then overhear Jet ask Camille to go on a date with him that night. Kelly and Gustavo then show up to the Palm Woods and they tell them that their recording session for the date is canceled because Gustavo's doctor ordered him to stay away from the things that stress him out due to his high blood pressure. And that includes the boys. And so pretty much Gustavo and Kelly tell them to not bother Gustavo for the next 24 hours. Since they have the day off, Carlos then decides that he wants to go on a date with Jennifer number three. So James is trying to make sure that Carlos doesn't mess up this date. It turns out to be harder than expected, and so James enlists Katie to help him with his plan. Meanwhile, Logan is upset with Camille, and so he creates a robot to be his perfect date to make Camille jealous, but Kendall convinces Logan to look for someone more human to go out with. So Logan goes to search for his perfect match, and he finds a girl named Lindsay. Meanwhile, Kendall sees Lucy at the Palmwoods lobby, but she acts really rude to him and he doesn't know why. So Kendall then runs into Lucy again. He finds yeah, her in a wig, dress, and glasses, and he soon learns that Lucy's parents are in town. And Lucy explains to Kendall that she's trying to keep it from her parents that she moved to LA to become a rock star since her parents are classical musicians and despise rockers. Her parents then invite Kendall to go out to dinner with them, and so he goes on a double date with Lucy. In Big Time Rush fashion, Gustavo and everyone else end up at the same restaurant called Chez Francais. Carlos and Jennifer at number three are on their date. James is disguised as a mustached waiter. Logan is on a double date with Camille and Jet, and Camille and Logan are fighting the entire dinner. Meanwhile, Kendall is with Lucy, 
and he is trying to help Lucy hide any signs that Lucy is a rocker after Lucy tells him that her parents sent her brother to military school after he dyed his hair and became a drummer for a rock band. Towards the end of the episode, however, Carlos uncovers James's disguise and makes him leave by throwing him on a cart and pushing him away. Logan and Camille get back together, and James accidentally knocks Gustavo over. James also accidentally knocks Lucy over, and Kendall catches Lucy and make sure her wig doesn't fall. However, when he helps her back up, her wig flies off and she is forced to come clean to her parents and her parents end up getting disappointed with her. But Kendall tells them that they should accept Lucy for who she is and that she's really talented. So the guys and Lucy take the stage and they perform the song Cover Girl on their guitars. And pretty much Lucy's parents are really impressed by the music and they decide to accept her stay her choice to stay in LA. Yeah, so the song Cover Girl, a very cute song. I think out of all the ballad type songs on the album though, Cover Girl is my least favorite. Overall, it's still a cute song and I really like the scene. And yeah, at the end of the episode, it turns out that Gustavo's blood pressure is back to normal. However, his blood pressure jumps dangerously high after he sees the restaurant check and the boys have to run over and calm him down. After rewatching this episode, I liked it a lot better than when I watched it as a kid. And I think it's mostly because I like Lucy just a lot more now than when I first watched the show. Like, I am a Lucy girly ride or die stand now. Next episode is Big Time Merchandise. At the beginning of this episode, Big Time Rush have a meeting with the RCM CPT Global Net Sanyoid marketing team about their new Big Time Rush merchandise that they are planning to sell at Selmart stores. The ideas that are pitched to Big Time Rush are horrible as they decide that some of the merchandise that they are going to be selling are Big Time Rush toilet scrubbers, BTR horse shampoo, and Big Time Rush action figures that say uncool things. Also, Selmart is a parody of Walmart. In order to make sure that these products aren't pitched, the boys, Gustavo and Kelly, come up with a plan to create their own merchandise to pitch at the meeting. Kendall and Carlos record new phrases for their dolls to say, and Gustavo uploads their files onto their voice chips. Meanwhile, James and Logan are trying to make a Big Time Rush perfume. So the next day, Big Time Rush, Gustavo, and Kelly pitch their ideas to Sam Selmart. However, it turns out that Gustavo uploaded the wrong files to the doll's voice chip, so their doll starts saying insulting phrases instead. Meanwhile, Logan and James's perfume accidentally blinds Sam Selmart because James added hot sauce to their mixture. And so Griffin ends up finding out about this, and he decides to pitch the original ideas to Sam Selmart himself. However, Sam Selmart hates these ideas, and in a panic, Griffin accidentally throws a Big Time Rush action doll, and it hits the button on Sam Selmart's bed and launches him across the room. And so now the boys and Griffin are banned from Selmart headquarters, and he pulls Big Time Rush's albums off of the Selmart shelves. In this episode, they almost kill the CEO of Selmart two times. And the running gag also in this episode is that Logan mentions times that he was bullied as a kid and the guys end up yelling at him we said we were sorry so it is now canon that the boys bullied logan as kids and yeah so the boys come up with a plan to sneak back into some art headquarters with griffin which involves their perfume and tree hats they manage to get in and talk to sam selmart who is about to throw them out but suddenly becomes intrigued by their tree hats instead so then sam selmart decides to sell big time rush tree hats and a limited edition big time rush robot zombie act set at his stores. Tree hats are used throughout the series in which the characters just use them to like spy on people and each other. I don't feel like I disclose that, but I feel like if you look at the screenshots enough, you can tell that there's a tree hat. And if you are asking, where was Katie in this episode? This girl had a stupid plot about a bathrobe. And I don't know why Katie wasn't in this A plot. Like, considering Miss Girl has been making Big Time Rush merchandise since the first season of the show. Like, if anyone knows what merchandise Big Time Rush should be selling, it would be this girl. So, I don't know why she's not in the A-plot, but whatever. She has a whole plot with Bitters about how her bathrobe is missing a belt 
and it just goes on way longer than I would like it to. And yeah, that is big time merchandise. The next episode we have is a big time surprise. And I don't think you guys are ready for this episode. If you haven't watched the show before, you are not ready for this episode. Even though there's technically no one hour long special in this season, the next two episodes could be counted as one because the storylines continue from one to the next. With this episode, we are getting the B plot out of the way first. So in the B plot, pretty much Griffin asks Gustavo and Kelly to kidnap him and they don't want to do it. So they get Logan and Carlos to do so. And the boys agree to do it only if they get solo albums out of it. So we have Carlos alone and we have Logalicious. And pretty much Logan and Carlos throw Griffin into a dumpster. However, they believe that they accidentally killed them after they can't find Griffin in the dumpster. At the end of the episode, it turns out that Griffin had a chip implanted in him and he wanted to test it if it worked. So his assistant ended up finding him instead. So in the C-plot, Katie and Mrs. Knight want to know what the cliffhanger is in the show Newtown High. And so Jet, who stars on the show, won't tell them the what the cliffhanger is about. So they steal his laptop and try to find the answer. Now we get to the A-plot. Okay, so pretty much in the A-plot, Kendall reveals that he's been trying to ask Lucy out on a date for the past couple weeks, but it just ends up being unsuccessful after the boys keep ruining his chances. So the boys finally decide to help Kendall ask Lucy out on a date, only for Lucy's ex-boyfriend, Bo, to show up at the Palmwoods, and he wants to get Lucy back. Kendall is about to, you know, give up asking Lucy on a date. However, Kendall then works with James and Jet to get rid of Bo after Kendall catches Bo making out with another girl in the elevator. The boys then try to come up with a plan to get Bo in trouble. So they plan to use Camille as bait because Bo doesn't know who Camille is. However, after a very confusing elevator ride, the plan doesn't work and Lucy, Camille, and Bo all end up in an elevator together and Camille is introduced to Bo as Lucy's best friend. So the episode then ends up with James and Jet ending up dressing like girls in order to bait Bo. And their plan actually works, and Bo tries to make a move on James, and James punches him in the face. So the boys record everything, but Bo ends up breaking the camera. However, Lucy has overheard everything that has happened, and she pretty much tells Bo to leave the Palmwoods. The episode ends with Kendall asking Lucy to go on a date with him, and they end up kissing in the elevator, only to reveal Joe. Who is standing on the other side of the elevator doors watching them kiss? So the big time surprise is that Miss Joe Taylor is back. Watching this as a kid was indeed a big time surprise. The next episode is Big Time Decision. So previously on Big Time Rush, Carlos gets turned into a tree by a witch. The boys have to hide Gustavo's body And there's also a bear. No, just kidding. Anyways, let's get the B plot out of the way. Carlos and James have a plot about this drink called Zombie Gone. And in the C plot, Katie decides to work at Rock Records for an extra credit assignment at school. And after she says something smart, Griffin hires Katie to run Rock Records. Gustavo, throughout this whole episode, is trying to prove that Katie is not fit to run the company. However, after three hours, Katie resigns and Gustavo signs Katie's slip because that's how long she needed to work for her extra credit assignment. And yeah, so she resigns and makes Gustavo the owner of Rock Records again, provided that he never bans her from the studio again. Anyways, back to the juicy stuff in this episode. So this episode starts right after the previous one ends. So Lucy and Joe finally meet. And in a panic, Kendall closes the elevator doors. And Joe reveals to Kendall that she's back because they canceled the sequels to the movies that she was going to star in because the the first movie was so horrible. 
that everyone hated it and it started a riot at the movie theater and they ended up burning the movie theater down and the production company announced that no more sequels would be made. Therefore, that is why she is back at the Palmwoods. So Kendall runs back into the apartment and hides in their locker and the boys are confused and Kendall is like, I'm not here. You don't know where I am and what I'm doing. And they're like, okay, they're very confused. And then Joe walks into the apartment and she asks where Kendall is. And the boys are like, we don't know where he is. So Kendall pretty much spends the entire day trying to avoid both Joe and Lucy. And Camille and Logan pretty much decide to help Kendall with his dilemma. So Logan tries to use love science and he creates a machine that will help Kendall figure out his feelings. However, it doesn't work after both girls get the same score and Kendall and they end up seeing Kendall through the window of his apartment. Kendall runs to Rock Records and he sees Katie who has just finished running the label. Katie tells Kendall to go on a walk to help him clear his mind and that his heart will tell him where he needs to go. So Kendall starts to walk back to the palm woods and reflect on which of the girls he would rather be with while the music video for their song no idea plays and okay for those of you who haven't watched this show before i want you to look at these screenshots just look at them and make a decision for who you think kendall will choose at the end of this episode just look at them Take a good close look at who do you think Kendall will end up with at the end of this episode. So Kendall arrives at the Palm Woods and makes his decision. And he chooses Joe. Oh, okay. Us girlies were gagged this episode. All right. Like as a kid, I was a Joe girly myself. I was rooting for Joe. But even watching this episode at the end, I was not expecting he would choose Joe. Literally, all of these signs were pointing towards Lucy. And then I decided to do some digging. I was like, why, why did they cop us out so badly in this episode? So it turns out that Scott Fellows, the creator of the show, actually intended to have Lucy stay at the Palmwoods and have Kendall choose her instead of Joe, which explains. All of the screenshots I showed you before. However, um, the actress, Melise Zhao, she gave notice at the end of Big Time Decision. And she was like, I have a project, you know, and so her contract said that she could get out of, you know, her contract for the show if she had another project sort of indoors. It was just a whole con contractual thing and you know contract negotiations that just didn't end up working out so at the end of this episode scott you know had to have kendall choose someone so he ends up choosing joe he was planning on having lucy be the one he picked and okay melise joe girl i'm sorry but i really think you fumbled with this one i know she probably left for a better deal Probably the Vampire Diaries. <laughs> I mean, she literally plays Anna from the Vampire Diaries. They're probably like, uh, girl, we need you here for season three. <laughs> no, just kidding. I don't know what she left this for. But anyways, like rewatching this, I don't know. I'm kind of mad that we didn't get Kendall and Lucy together just to see more of that dynamic. I think I'm also maybe saying this because Joe and Kendall's storylines are kind of boring once they get back together um anyways that was the big that was the episode big time decision the next episode we have is big time babysitting and honestly i'm not gonna lie the quality of the episodes in the second half of this season as well as the fourth season they just decline writing like wise like for this season i feel like since lucy leaves the show there are a lot of things that the creator and the writers were possibly planning in the direction of Lucy, but since they didn't have Lucy, they couldn't do those storylines. They had probably either had to change the storylines or change the situations, but like, I don't know. Like, the next couple episodes just like aren't my favorite. I completely forgot that they existed. In this episode, pretty much Kendall and Logan have to take care of this rock legend known as Baby Lace before his Hall of Fame induction. However, Baby Lace isn't making it 
easy for them because the running gag of this whole episode for baby lays is that he keeps coming close to death so he falls out a window and he repeatedly keeps getting heart attacks in which logan has to keep resuscitating him and he also eats shrimp that he knows he's deathly allergic to. So yeah, the running gigs are mostly about baby lace almost dying. And I'm just like, where did this come from? In the B plot, James and Carlos are forced to take care of Katie because of orders from Mrs. Knight. So they're babysitting Katie, who keeps wanting to escape the palm woods and run to the arcade across the street to play a game. Meanwhile, Kendall is trying to build his relationship with Joe up again because it's kind of awkward between them because of what happened in previous episodes. And yeah, instead of having a date with Joe like Kendall planned he would, now he has to take care of baby lace, baby lace which makes things even more awkward. And I think Joe like th- sums this up perfectly. She says, "Try seeing the boy you never forgot about kiss another girl in an elevator, then wait around while he takes all day to decide whether he wants you back or not." Things for Kendall, not looking good. So pretty much Kendall decides to sing a song to Joe with the baby lace. However, that doesn't work because baby lace keeps dying throughout this whole episode. And so Kendall and Joe finally have a talk and they decide to start their relationship over and Kendall asks her out on a date. And yeah, so at the end of the episode, they all make it to the Hall of Fame awards in one piece. Next episode we have is Big Time Gold. So in this episode, Big Time Rush get a gold record and have a whole ceremony about it. However, they only get one gold record in which Gustavo wants to keep at Rock Records. James and Carlos have a plot where they think the gold record is pure gold and they want to listen to their record in pure gold. However, at the end of the episode they just learn that it's just an old vinyl that has been painted that has been spray painted gold and gustavo grabs a hammer and chases james and carlos meanwhile in kendall and logan's plot kendall accidentally forgets joe's birthday thinking that it's on the 23rd instead of the 21st so kendall has to quickly scramble around to get her birthday date set up so he plans on getting joe a gold necklace however he doesn't have enough money to pay for it so logan offers to pay for it and have kendall pay him back kendall then has logan wrap up the necklace while he's off setting up all the rest of joe's birthday things however camille walks into the apartment and thinks that Logan got the necklace for her instead. Throughout this whole episode, Kendall and Logan are passing the necklace between their dates, and eventually they end up fighting over it and breaking it into two. And they pretty much try to fix it. However, they fail to, and they both think that they are bad boyfriends. However, Camille and Joe learn about what happened because they're friends and they talk. And they pretty much tell the boys that they're good boyfriends. And instead of getting them a gold necklace, they actually got them each a bracelet instead, which the boys put on them with duct tape. And yeah, the episode ends with the boys having a double date at the Palmwoods pool. Meanwhile, Gustavo chases James and Carlos with a hammer. So this is one of the Big Time Rush episodes I genuinely forgot about. Even like writing the script for this video, recapping all these episodes, I almost forgot to include this episode. I forgot this episode. I didn't... I don't even know if I watched it as a kid or not. Like I I remember the vinyl record plot, but I don't remember the gold necklace plot at all. <laughs> that is Big Time Gold. The next episode we have is Big Time Camping. In this episode, the boys are disappointed to learn that Gustavo won't allow them to go camping because it is too dangerous and Gustavo is worried about their safety. The boys tell Joe and Camille this and Joe realizes that she knows a place where they can go camping. So Joe takes the boys, Camille and the Jennifers, to the Newtown High soundstage because they had just shot a camping episode. But while they're there, they have to be careful not to get caught by the on-duty security guards since they don't have clearance to be on the set after hours. So then the camping trip turns into a girls versus boys competition, only for the girls to learn that the boys are really bad at camping and they accidentally turn on the sprinklers while trying to light a fire on the soundstage. Meanwhile, Gustavo and Kelly have learned about the boys' camping plans and they are trying to put a stop to it. So after getting soaked in the sprinklers, 
hours. The boys split up to find food and clothes at the studio. So James and Carlos find craft services. Meanwhile, Logan and Kendall find their wardrobe. And so Logan finds a bear costume and puts it on only to get whisked away by the production crew, thinking that he's a stuntman for the commercial shooting on the lot at the time. And yeah, fun fact about this episode. Again, this episode is shot outside of stage 27 of Colossal Studios, which is actually like one of the stages they filmed. They shot on at Paramount Studios. The area that Kendall, that James and Carlos were getting snacks at is actually like their own craft services, I think. And then also the area where Kendall and Logan are, um, that's their actual, like where their dressing rooms are and their wardrobes are. So Joe and Camille decide to search for Kendall and Logan because the boys have been gone for too long. And they find Kendall who tells them that they can't, he can't find Logan. And they find a call sheet for the day and they learn that there is a commercial shooting on a lot about a bear getting beat up by ninjas. Meanwhile, Jennifer number two gets caught by the security guard after she tries to find where Carlos and James went. Carlos and James pretty much see Jennifer in the prison and they come up with a plan to save her and they manage to get her out and she kisses Carlos. Is that hinting to something? We may never know. And yeah, so at the end of the episode, everyone ends up on the set of the commercial and they team up to save Logan from getting beat up by these ninja guys. And so Gustavo then allows the boys to camp and they end up camping in front of the Rock Records building. And yeah, that is the end of Big Time Camping. And this also marks the final appearance as the Jennifers as a group. The next episode we have is Big Time Rescue. So the kiss from the previous episode did lead to something. Now Carlos and Jennifer at number two are dating, but the boys notice that Carlos has been acting differently now that he is dating her. This is barely even a plot, but pretty much Mrs. Knight is having tooth trouble, so she has to go to the dentist to get it fixed. This comes in later. Kendall is starting to believe that Carlos is under a spell by Jennifer number two. So Kendall asks Joe to help him save Carlos and show Carlos what a healthy relationship is supposed to look like. However, Joe is quick to shut it down because she says that every time they do things like that, they end up fighting. Kendall eventually convinces Joe to help him, but throughout the day, Kendall inadvertently ends up hurting Joe and accidentally breaks up with her. Kendall then soon realizes that Carlos isn't under a spell by Jennifer number two two, it turns out that she's actually a really good kisser. Kendall ends up apologizing to Joe and Joe makes Kendall wear a pink sweater because he promised that he would if she he ended up hurting her. So yeah, they try to warn Carlos about Jennifer, but they fail again. And then Kendall and Joe run into Mrs. Knight and she tells Kendall that she got medicine for her tooth and it numbs the pain away. And Kendall then comes up with a plan. So Kendall puts medicine on a tube of lip balm and gives it to Carlos, who, whose nip, lips become numb after he uses the lip balm. And so Jennifer, number two, kisses him and tries to boss him around, but it doesn't work since he can't feel her kisses. And so the two of them break up. I honestly didn't realize how much kissing actually happens in this show. Um, There is a lot of kissing in this episode. Anyway, so in the B-plot, James and Logan end up volunteering at a dog shelter to help find dogs find homes. However, when the time is up, the shelter worker tells them that the dogs will have to be put down since they don't have enough room for the dogs. So desperate to help the dogs, James and Logan adopt the 12 dogs and continue to help find someone to adopt all of these dogs. Meanwhile, in the C-plot, Gustavo and Katie are trapped in Gustavo's secret vault but Gustavo can't remember the password he set for his code. At the end of the episode, Gustavo and Katie end up getting out of the vault and pretty much he finds all the dogs that Logan and James brought to Rock Records and he decides to use the the dogs in the boys' music video for the song Time of Our Life and the dogs are later adopted by fans. We're gonna party all night, have the time of our lives, yeah. Underrated song, to be quite honest, but I also, as a kid, I thought that that song was on the 24-7 album because it just sounds like it should be on the 24-7 album, but no, it's on the Elevate album. But yeah, anyways, I think I remember this episode the most from when I was a kid because 
I don't know. I still think this episode holds up. The next episode we have is Big Time Bloopers. And if you couldn't tell, this is their blooper reel episode. So at the beginning of this episode, the boys mistakenly ruin the tape of their last episode titled Big Time Bear, directed by Kendall Schmidt. So they quickly set up a blooper episode hosted by Stephen Kramer Glickman, who plays Gustavo and Sierra Bravo. Now we have the episode Big Time Marvin, And this is their other crossover that they did with the show Marvin Marvin. I don't know if anyone remembers the show Marvin Marvin. This episode, for me at least, was genuinely so hard to find because I swear, Marvin Marvin is a show that has been literally wiped off the face of the earth. Nobody wants to remember the show. Not even Lucas Cruikshank, who stars as Marvin. But I found this episode on YouTube in wonderful 240p. Um, Even like Nickelodeon, couldn't even be bothered to take down this episode that was uploaded by a random person 10 years ago. Also, there's nothing that ages you more than seeing a YouTube video that has been posted 10, 11, 12 years ago. Wow. But anyways, um, let's get started with this episode summary. In this episode, Big Time Rush are in Portland, Oregon for their tour, and the characters Marvin and Terry are planning on going to Big Time Rush's concert. During their concert, however, the character Henry, played by Jacob Bertrand, who's on Cobra Kai, I believe, or I don't know, he's been in a lot of stuff as of lately. He pretty much sneaks into their dressing room and he learns that the band got kidnapped by this alien race called the Clerg and they're disguising themselves as Big Time Rush. And the Clerg are trying to find this other alien race called a Clutonian by detecting a certain dance. I forgot to give context to the show Marvin Marvin. (laughs) Marvin Marvin is about this alien named Marvin who arrives on Earth and he is from, he is Clutonian or something. And I think it's like, he has a similar origin story to Superman. He's just not as cool as Superman. I think that's the premise of Marvin Marvin. I'm not too sure. The Clerk perform as Big Time Rush and they perform their theme song again, Big Time Rush. And then they perform the song Halfway There, which apparently has a specific frequency in which only Clutonians can hear, which causes them to dance stupidly. So during the song, Marvin and Terry start dancing. Henry tackles Marvin before BTR can spot them. There was no clear screenshot of henry tackling marvin so this is what we get the clerk see terry dancing and they mistake her for being a clutonian so they bring her up on stage and take her backstage to their dressing room in order to destroy her thinking that she's clutonian and meanwhile marvin and henry are arrested and they're trying to figure out a plan to save terry anyway so marvin and henry end up escaping and they find terry and um yeah this is what marvin's alien form looks like this is what a clutonian looks like i don't know and yeah so they find a tank of helium which i guess helium destroys the clerg it's not very clear in this episode the helium pretty much helps marvin destroy the clerg and then it causes marvin's voice to be high-pitched which is a reference to lucas crookshank's character fred they manage to get the real big time rush back I don't think this is canon to the TV show at all. Like, I think this is Big Time Rush pretending to be their real selves. Like, I think this is Big Time Rush as their real selves. At the end of the episode, the boys performed their song, Show Me. Per- this song was also one of the songs that was never performed on the Big Time Rush show at all. So um, I don't know what's up with that, but Show Me is probably one of their cuntiest songs that they have. Like, I'll talk about the song later in this episode. I think the boys are playing themselves. I don't think it's the characters from the show. And also, this was the season finale for Marvin Marvin because Lucas Cruikshank decided to just leave Nickelodeon. He's just like, I'm out. I'm done. I don't want to work on these types of shows anymore, which I don't blame him because this show was honestly really bad. Like, I mean, the Fred shows were also pretty bad, but at least like with Fred, that was a character he created. But apparently for this show... They just kind of got him on it. I don't even know how that they got him on it, but like he had no involvement in the production, character, anything like that for the show. It was just like he was simply cast as Marvin on the show and they were like, okay, make a season out of this. So yeah, I don't blame Lucas Cruikshank for leaving Nickelodeon and leaving the show and all that. Anyways, now we can talk about these season three songs. Season three just has the songs that weren't 
really performed in season two. So any songs that weren't performed in season two are performed in this season. We are working with the Elevate album here. So any songs off of the Elevate album that weren't performed in the second season are performed in this season. However, the only songs on this album that aren't performed in the show at all are the songs Invisible, You Are Not Alone, and Epic. Invisible and You're Not Alone, they're both ballads, so I can sort of see why they wouldn't be performed on the show. Epic was just a bonus track, so let's walk through how many times each song was performed. So, Music Sounds Better With You was performed one time, not on their show, but it was on the How to Rock. It was on How to Rock. And Show Me was performed one time on Marvin Marvin. I do think that they did these crossovers because they got to perform songs that they didn't have time to fit on their show their actual show so i think most of their crossovers were just you know another kind of marketing thing right it was like also they were doing some marketing for shows that weren't as popular on the net network at the time so like how to rock wasn't extremely popular and marvin marvin definitely was not that popular on the network so having big time rush sort of give them that type of popularity was fine so i guess that's why they performed their songs like music sounds better with you and show me and also these songs i feel like in a Scott Fellow show, I don't think that he would be able to incorporate them e- either because, again, Music Sounds Better With You has the word hell in it. So it was like Nickelodeon probably just kind of wanted to sweep that song under the rug. But then they decided to make this song um, one of their singles, one of their promotional singles. So they were like, oh, we can't sweep it out of the rug. So we have to um, censor the word hell. And yeah, so a bunch of 11-year-olds, you know, were gasping when they first heard the song for the first time when Kendall says the word hell. Um, Now it's like the shock value of things has gone down significantly. So it's like an 11-year-old hearing this song today wouldn't even bat an eye at that. And yeah, Show Me, like Show Me for Real is one of their cuntiest songs. Um, And I'm not even exaggerating. Like once we get to the 24-7 album, I'll have more to say about this. But it's like this song, it's like the lyrics are kind of like, I wouldn't say sexual, but they're they're kind of like more mature than you're kind of used to. And I'm I'm down for that. Like Show Me is one of my favorite songs. And I do wish that they performed it on their actual show, but they didn't get a chance. All over again, zero times this season. No idea, one time. Cover Girl, two times. Love Me, Love Me, five times. I didn't realize how much they played Love Me, Love Me on the show. If I Rule the World, zero. Invisible, zero. Time of Our Life, four times. Again, I didn't... I also didn't realize they played this song a lot. I only remember it in Big Time Rescue. So I think they performed it throughout the whole season, just like... I just don't remember. Superstar, zero. You're not alone, zero. Elevate, five times. Makes sense. The album is called Elevate. Um, Epic, zero. Blow your speakers, one time. Windows down, two times. Paralyze, zero. And moving up to Bel Air, one time. So that is the season three songs. Um, And yeah. We can move on to season four. This is the final season of the show, and it aired from May 2nd, 2013 to July 25th, 2013. And it has a total of 12 episodes, 13 episodes, depending on how you count. The first episode we have is Big Time Invasion. And I think this season is the season that references the group's actual, like, lives you know at the beginning of of this episode the band pretty much learns that a bunch of new british bands are invading the american music business and big time rush is afraid that they these bands are going to be the end of big time rush's career imagine if this episode happened like now in 2024 and they started saying that k-pop invaded the invaded the American music scene. That would be interesting. The groups that are invading the scene include One Direction and The Wanted, Hair 3, Colorful Pants, and Simon Cowell's Next Boy Band. I find this so interesting because, you know, One Direction opened for Big Time Rush on their tour and all that. And apparently, you know, it was like Big Time Rush didn't think it was a great idea for One Direction to open for them because, you know, I think... Big Time Rush, they were already popular themselves. But then, you know, having another boy band that had come from the X Factor that already was popular themselves, you know, it's like, why would they need One Direction to open for them? And why would One Direction need to go on a Big Time Rush tour? Like, that marketing did not make sense ever. So anyways, so like, no one thought it was a good idea, but it happened anyways. In this episode, we learn that James will work for Hugs. 
and pretty much the boys wonder what they can do to save their careers. And Katie suggests that they hire a new manager because Gustavo already has his hands full being their music producer and all that, and he's spreading his self too thin and so they pretty much asked katie to be their new manager but she's just like sorry boys i'm too busy trying to find a new friend at the palm woods that i can talk to boys with because i can't with you guys the boys decide to go and find new managers but they but they disagree on who they want as their manager kendall and carlos go with the first one and then james and kendall go on with the second one could not be bothered to learn their names so we have old guy and lex luther dupe their managers get them new opportunities, but in the process, the boys are too busy trying to compete with each other, and so they end up eventually having a spitball fight, and their new managers don't approve of their chaotic ways and fire them. Yeah, there's a whole thing with spitballs in this episode as well. I, I don't know why. And yeah, so in the B-plot, Katie is trying to find a best friend to talk about boys with, but Mr. Bitters has now turned the Palm Woods into a business men living place. Katie and Buddha Bob try to kick all of the businessmen out and they manage to do so successfully. However, um, it turns out that the new wave of Palm Woods people end up being a bunch of boys moving into the Palm Woods instead. At the end of the episode, Mrs. Knight tell the boys not to worry about their careers and that they, at the end of the day, they just have to do their job and make good music and they have to do their job like nobody is around, which is a song the boys sing and it is a certified bop. I love this song. Do it like nobody's around. Do it like nobody's around. Do it like nobody's around. Uh, 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 uh. So pretty much they perform the song like nobody's around and they have a music video that goes with it that has been posted online and all of that. And pretty much in the music video, they make references to different boy bands, specifically American boy bands over the eras. So for, for this one, it's either... The Four Seasons or the Ink Spot. Then we have the Temptations. Um, then, you know, we have the Jackson 5, New Kids on the Block, Backstreet Boys, NSYNC. They make references to all of these different boy bands. And then finally, Big Time Rush perform in their Big Time Rush look, which pretty much just includes skinny jeans and graphic tees. I think that was a style back in 2014, 2013. Then at the end of the episode, the boys are trying their best to talk about boys with Katie. And that is how the episode ends. The next episode we have is Big Time Scandal. And girlies, you are not ready for this one. At the beginning of this episode, Gustavo is telling the boys that they need to stop being involved in scandals, especially scandals that the paparazzi can use against them and they make a nude joke in this episode which i was kind of surprised nickelodeon allowed but now um with a lot of things coming to light about nickelodeon now a lot of things don't surprise me about the network anyway so james asks gustavo if he can go on a date with taylor swift and gustavo says no because he doesn't want them to get swifted did is when you date taylor swift break up with her, and then she writes a song about you being a total jerk face. Kelly then runs into the studio in a panic, and she tells the boys that Lucy Stone has dropped a new album and has a single on it called You Dump Me For Her, and Kendall realizes that he has been swifted by Lucy. So the boys and Gustavo listen to the song and they realize that they are in a PR disaster. The lyrics to her song go, You dumped me for her. You gave me your word. You kissed me in an elevator. And then you said, see you later. How could you do that to me? I'm afraid she ate with those lyrics. Like, I'm afraid she ate. The boys then are about to leave the studio to settle the situation with Lucy when all of a sudden the paparazzi shows up at Rock Records with the hope of talking to Kendall. So James and Kendall escape um, the studio by going through the back door and they go to the Palm Woods. Meanwhile, Carlos, Logan, Gustavo, and Kelly are going to handle the paparazzi. 
However, while trying to handle things with the paparazzi, Carlos and Logan involve themselves in another scandal as they are photographed hitting and robbing old women. James is upset because of all of the negative publicity the band is getting and also that he can't make out with Lucy now that she's back. And so as a result, him and Katie decide to create an internet rumor that he is doing a duet with Cher Lloyd on her new single, With Your Love. And also... In this episode, we learned that James blew up Cher Lloyd's car with fireworks one time. And the mention of them of him blowing up Cher Lloyd's car with fireworks was an actual reference to something that happened like in like in real life that involved the boys and fireworks. And the real life in like the real life situation involved them being at a party in Nashville with Taylor Swift absolutely crazy so yeah i'm i mean it's like just crazy how many taylor swift references there are in this episode also me trying to figure out if that was true or not was absolutely insane like again i i got this from a whole tumblr blog so if you're interested in learning about that situation with big time rush and fireworks go ahead um there's plenty of information about that this whole episode just screams 2013 with Cher Lloyd and apparently like to Scott Fellows he was like well I wanted like a newer celebrity that was a bit less lone and so he thought that Cher Lloyd was perfect for big time rush Kendall and Joe plan to go talk to Lucy at her music video shoot for her song elevator kisses (laughs) and they pretty much try to convince Lucy to not tell the public that Kendall is the guy that she is singing the song about. And so Lucy is like, don't worry, I won't say the song is about Kendall because I care about Kendall being my friend and Big Time Rush and all of that. However, Kendall decides to list the ways that the song is inaccurate. And so Lucy then gets mad at Kendall for saying that and she pretty much decides to call a press conference and says that she's going to tell the world that Kendall is a total jerk face. Yeah, so this is the OG driver's license drama, okay? When the driver's license drama happened, like the whole Olivia Rodrigo, Sabrina Carpenter, Joshua Bassett stuff happened, I already seen this film before and I didn't like the ending, okay? I didn't bat an eye when that happened because I already lived through it, okay? And this was more stressful than anything else at the time the boys are still trying to attempt to sort out their scandals and they perform the song pictured this with a music video picture this first kiss need the moonlight logan carlos and kelly pretty much get gustavo to dress up as an old lady so they can get a picture of um carlos and logan helping an old lady across the street however the running gag is that gustavo keeps getting hit by a bus every single time me, Joe and Kendall realize that their scandal is now much bigger than they thought it would be. So they now enlist the help of Buddha Bob, Jet, and Camille to help them pretty much figure out this scandal with Lucy. So since Lucy swifted Kendall, they plan to Kanye Lucy by interrupting her press conference and prevent Lucy from saying anything. So yeah, that's a reference to the 2009 VMAs. And also when Camille offers to help Kendall with his scandal, she says she'll help the boys and that and she'll also include a plug of her appearance in the movie Rock Camp 9 Still Campin, which is a parody to Camp Rock. Kendall, Joe, Buddha Bob, Jet, and Camille all managed to sneak into Lucy's press conference wearing a bunch of different disguises. So after Gustavo nearly dies multiple times in this episode, they realize that Rock Records had security cameras outside the entire time. So they are they end up clearing Carlos and Logan's scandals pretty quickly. Meanwhile, James decides to sneak onto Cher Lloyd's music video set and their director decides to post the music video and they go viral. They get 10 million hits. And now it is the press conference and Kendall and Joe's plan at Lucy, at Lucy's press conference is not going well. Um, Lucy is able to spot her friends in the audience and then she is about to reveal who the song is about. However... Um, before she can drop the name, the rest of the boys from BTR show up to the press conference and 
end up convincing Lucy not to reveal who the song is about. And so Lucy decides to let Kendall off the hook and says that the song isn't about him. And it's specifically a rather a combination of guys she's gone out with in the past. And Lucy also points out that she didn't date Kendall long enough to be considered an official cl- a couple as You know, they only kiss once and they had half a date. So yeah, she tells the audience, but mostly Joe and the boys, that it was great seeing them again and she thanks them all for coming. And as Lucy walks off the stage, she sees Kendall and Joe in the audience silently thanking her and she winks at Kendall. So the guys and Joe end the day with hanging out at the Palmwoods lobby where they learn that Lucy is moving back into the palm woods so that is big time scandals this is one of my favorite episodes to this day um you know i i just like the references to pop culture and all that and i like that this was a way for them to bring lucy back into the plot especially since like she left after the end of season three and i feel like her leaving was also just very abrupt like they didn't plan on her to leave that quickly like obviously like i think they wanted to learn more about her character and all that but it ended up not being that way so her being back in season four brings in a lot of drama a lot of you know different dynamics the next episode we have is big time lies lucy has moved back into the palm woods kendall and the boys are trying to figure out which apartment she has moved into since they don't know And so Kendall's mom tells him that they have to get used to Lucy living at the Palmwoods again. And Kendall and Joe decide that they are going to go on a pool date. And then when they are about to leave, Lucy steps in between them. And they learn that Lucy is living down the hall from the boys. And so with Lucy back at the Palmwoods, the boys and Joe don't know how to act around her. So for the B-plot of this episode, Carlos and James play a game of soda bowling at Rock Records and accidentally destroy Gustavo's office. And they pretty much don't want to get in trouble. So they stir up a bunch of lies saying that, you know, they were attacked by robbers and all of that. Meanwhile, in Logan's plot, he pretends to be sick to avoid going on a theater, going to a theater show that Camille wants to go to. Camille takes Logan to Dr. Hollywood, so now they have to come up with a plan to prove to Camille that Logan is sick. So back in Kendall's plot, the drama begins to unfold when Lucy starts to flirt with Kendall and to avoid problems with Joe, Kendall decides to keep it a secret that Lucy is talking to him and flirting with him again. So Kendall goes to his mom and Katie for advice and Katie pretty much tells him to just ignore the flirting and the problem will go away on itself. Meanwhile, Mrs. Knight just tells him to be honest with Joe and Lucy. However, Kendall decides to lie to Joe and it results in his pants bursting on fire. So pretty much throughout this whole episode... Kendall keeps having run-ins with Lucy and runs out of pants to wear, so he has to wear his mom's pants. And so Lucy is in their apartment, and she's saying that she's trying to write a song, and it's going to be a really good song. And so Joe is about to enter the apartment, so Kendall has Lucy hide in their slide. However, Lucy accidentally reveals herself to Joe, and this forces Kendall to come about what has been happening. And pretty much he apologizes, and he tells Joe that, you know, it's like, if, you know, I lied to you, you said that we would break up again. And so Joe reveals to him that she lied to him as well, and that she was bothered by Lucy um, being at the Palm Woods, even though she said she wasn't. And then Lucy decides to apologize to both of them. And she is just like, yeah, I'm not really interested in Kendall again. I was only doing it to start drama as a songwriting technique because after Kendall chose Joe over her, she just, she wrote the best songs of her life and now she can't write a song. And so both Kendall and Joe make amends and Lucy and Joe finally become friends with each other. That is big time lies. And honestly, Lucy is such a me. Like, she's such a vibe. She's so me. I, too, would be petty like that. Um, Like, I, too, would be making drama like that. So, like, I can't even be mad at Lucy for any of what she's doing. The next episode we have is Big Time Bonus. And this is one of the episodes I remember I watched a lot as a kid. So, at the beginning of the episode, Big Time Rush realized that they don't have any money. So, they ask Gustavo for a raise. And Gustavo and Kelly pretty much tell them that Griffin is the one that decides how much money that they get. In this episode, we also learn that they did a foreign food commercial. 
And pretty much Griffin tells the boys that he will let them access their accounts if they can prove that they are responsible with their money. So he pretty much gives them a $20,000 bonus. And if they can give the money back to him by the next by the next day, they will have full access to their accounts. So with the money, James decides to buy a snake named Gordon to impress Lucy due to a lyric he heard in one of her songs. But when he shows up to her apartment with his snake, she says that it was a a metaphor for bad boy and that she actually hates snakes. Carlos decides to hire an assistant Meanwhile, Logan heads off to the bank to deposit his money so he can easily withdraw it the next day. However, on the way there, he becomes interested in tipping culture. Kendall decides to keep his money in a towel because he believes that this is a trap from Griffin. Katie suggests to Kendall that he should do what Griffin would do and invest his money in stocks. So Kendall listens to Katie and decides to invest his money in oranges because they are his favorite food. So Katie tells him to buy $5,000 worth of Sun Squeeze stock, but Kendall accidentally buys $5,000 worth of oranges, which come in a truck. So in this episode, um, James ends up losing his snake and now he has to figure out a way to get it back. Logan spends all of his cash on tips until he only has $1 left and that's given to him by Camille. And Carlos runs out of money to pay his assistant so he can't afford his assistants anymore. So his assistant quits. And Kendall and Katie are trying to figure out what to do with the $5,000 worth of oranges, but they have no success. So the boys collectively end up with $1 left, and they decide to buy a fruit snack with it from the vending machine and accept their loss. However, Logan rips the pack of gummies and they all fall to the floor, which then attracts James's snake to them animal guy or whatever buys james's snake off of him for a hundred dollars and with that money they hire carlos's assistant back for another hour because his assistant claims that he knows someone who will buy kendall's truckload of oranges and then by the end of the episode they come up with the twenty thousand dollars before they meet griffin so at the end of the episode griffin decides to give them access to their accounts but the boys decline the offer and walk away And at the end of the episode, it is revealed that Griffin was the one who bought the truckload of oranges. Yeah. Oh, I also forgot that they performed the song 24-7 in a montage. Next episode we have is titled Big Time Cameo. In this episode, the guys tell Gustavo that they are tired of having cameo appearances in different shows and commercials. And one of the shows is Scott Baio's Taser Tots. The only reason why Scott Baio is in here is because James Maslow was on Scott Baio's Nickelodeon show, See Dad Run. I'm pretty sure Taser Tots goes crazy, you guys. Anyways, so Gustavo tells them that he gets he's got them a cameo on the show called Coco.0, and they are about to turn it down until they learn that it is Carlos's favorite show and that he has a big crush on the main actress of the show. So they agree to do it based on Carlos's insistence and so the boys gustavo kelly and katie show up to the set of this new of the show and they meet the main actress darla and her evil stepmother who controls her entire career so gustavo kelly and katie realize that the script for this episode of coco point oh is really bad and they decide to rewrite it they try to change the script because it's they say that it makes james look self-centered logan look like a science nerd carlos look like an idiot and kendall look like he ha- he's pep talk ready again this is a reference to their own show and their you know, their creator, Scott Fellows. Throughout this whole episode, Kendall is tasked to help Carlos and help him make his, you know, fairy tale dreams come true with Darla. Carlos wants him and Darla to have this happily fairy fairy tale ever after kind of relationship. However, the evil stepmother keeps catching Carlos and Darla together, and she threatens that if they don't leave her alone, she will tweet out to all of Darla's fans and give Big Time Rush really bad publicity. And we learn that Coco Girl has 14 million followers on the app Tweety. So OG influencer. So crazy. Yeah. So pretty much Carlos and Kendall keep getting caught by Darla's evil stepmother in which Kendall responds, let go of me, you wicked witch. And also in the scene, Kendall says to Carlos, I'm going to kick your beep. 
in the V plot, Logan and James are trying to find more tasty snacks since they don't like the ones at the Coco Point O craft services set. So they find delicious snacks at the Yo Gabba Gabba set, but the Yo Gabba Gabba stars won't let them have any. In the end, James and Logan are able to convince the Yo Gabba Gabba stars and they end up having a cameo on their show. The Yo Gabba Gabba plot goes crazy, you guys. Logan and James finish up their cameo at Yo Gabba Gabba and Carlos and Kendall are still trying to figure out how to deal with Darla's evil stepmother. Katie, Gustavo, and Kelly are able to rewrite the script for the show and Big Time Rush end up making a cameo on the show and Carlos and Darla finally kiss. This, however, angers Darla's evil stepmother who has a meltdown on set, which Katie records on Darla's phone. They pretty much blackmail the stepmother that they are going to post the video to all of Darla's 14 million followers. And so the evil stepmother allows Big Time Rush to continue their cameo and the boys perform the song Confetti Falling. Underrated song, by the way. And then finally, the episode ends with the boys watching their cameo on the show and then them breaking the fourth wall. And also, Lucas Cruikshank makes an appearance. And that's the end of Big Time Cameo. So... The next episode we have is Big Time Tour Bus, and this episode was actually directed by Carlos of Big Time Rush. If you didn't know this already, Carlos has a YouTube channel that he's pretty much been posting videos on since like Big Time Rush started airing, I believe. But one of his most iconic videos is the Call Me Maybe Carly Rae Jepsen video with all of those celebrities that literally had nothing but the photo booth app, iMovie, and a dream during that time. Like, this was a moment in pop culture history, a moment of Carly Rae Jepsen, Carl, Call Me Maybe, like, so such a moment in pop culture. And, you know, it had Justin Bieber, Selena Gomez, Ashley Tisdale. It was, like, the weirdest, like, uh, mash of celebrities there were, but it was also the most... That was why it was such an iconic video. Anyways, I just... I needed to add that reference I just need to add that fact somewhere in this video, and so I chose to do it here. Yeah, anyways, for this episode, the guys are on a two-week-long radio tour with Victoria Justice to help them promote their third album. But pretty much on their way to their next performance in San Diego, they get stuck in this massive traffic jam, and pretty much Kendall misses Joe and is waiting to talk to her on video chat. Meanwhile, Carlos is trying to record behind-the-scenes footage for their fans to post online for them. So Carlos shows Kendall the video he posted of them before they left on tour and Kendall decides to look through the comments on that video and sees that there are a lot of hate comments on the video. So Carlos then reveals to Kendall that he's like, yeah, we never let you look at the comments of our videos because we know that you'll just get upset over them. And then Kendall, then Carlos also accidentally slips that someone has made a website called IHateBTR.com. So pretty much Kendall searches this website up and sees that there's an anonymous hater that keeps posting mean information about the band, especially about Kendall and Joe's relationship. Kendall is a hater in this episode, and that is so me vibes. Like, I am also a hater as well. Anyway, so... There's also a scene in this episode where Kendall says to James, he's like, did you know people hate me and Joe? And James respond, yeah, they say you look like siblings. The scream I scrumped when I heard this line, like a siblings are dating joke. I was not expecting that. I completely forgot about that joke. I was like, that was that that was so good. I have to give it. I have to give it to whoever wrote. So on the other tour bus, James and Logan get into an argument over Logan's well-meaning but rigid and perfectionist tour habits that James just cannot stand. So James end up, ends up hurting Logan's feelings after he tells them that no one in the band wants to share a tour bus with Logan. And then he starts to feel bad after when Logan points out his own habits are aggravating to him too. So James finally sees all the hard work that Logan, you know, puts to make sure things are running smoothly for the guys on tour. James apologizes to Logan and they make up. In the C-plot, Katie and Mrs. Knight are also stuck in this traffic jam with a convertible that's top 
won't go up. Victoria Justice, who is also touring with them, has to perform extra sets of her music to buy them time to get there. And then at the end of the episode, the guys show Kendall some of the positive comments that the group receives on their videos and that they have received over time. And pretty much it inspires the guys to create a music video for their song Crazy For You while they're stuck in their traffic jam that is dedicated to all their fans. And then the traffic jam finally is over and the boys make it to the concert very late, but they make it to the concert anyways. The next episode we have is Big Time Pranks 2. So this episode opens with the guys and Katie watching their annual countdown clock to the day of pranks. As it reaches zero, Katie and Kendall, the co-king and queen of last year's day of pranks, bring out the divided crown that they have and put the paths together. However, their fun is stopped when Mrs. Knight takes the crown and tells them that ye day of pranks is cancelled. Again, I mentioned in my previous video that their ages drive me sort of insane in this show because we never have any birthday episodes. We are only told verbally like what their ages are when it's convenient for them. So I made a little timeline. So in the pilot, I believe that the guys are around 15 years old. Then in Big Time Mansion, Kendall reveals that they are 16 years old. And then in season two, that is... It is believed that they are around the ages of 16 to 17 years old. And then in Big Time Pranks, I believe they would have to be 17 years old because in this episode, they set the countdown timer for the next year, which is now in this episode. So they counted down the whole year to this episode. Um, and then so in Big Time Movie, they have to be 17 years old as well. And in season three, they have to be 17 or turning 18 years old because in season four they are 18 years old it is it is verbally said that they are 18 years old they're adults now so yeah that is the timeline of big time rush at ages in their tv show back to the episode um in the episode the adults tell the boys that the ye day of pranks is stupid and that they have better things to do However, the kids then challenge the adults to the day of pranks, thinking that the adults are too old and that's why they don't know how to have any fun. So the adults accept the challenge and they try to prove to the kids that they are still young and they say that if they win, the day of pranks is going to be canceled forever. So the kids team up to take out the adults, team up together to take out the adults, and Logan pranks himself out. So the order of who gets pranked out first. So the first one that gets, so after Logan, the first one that gets pranked out is Mr. Bitters after Kendall's prank phone call for him. Then it is Buddha Bob who gets um, glued to the ventilation vent by Katie and Carlos and they put a hit me sticker on his butt. Then the next person is Kelly after she gets scared by Camille. Logan then becomes the prankster gangsta, the prankster gangsta, and he is in charge of pretty much providing the rest of the kids with pranks to take down the adults. Meanwhile, James is trying to convince Lucy to go out with him and he says you just lost a first class ticket on Air Diamond and there's no standby unless you want to make out and then next scene cuts to him saying to Kendall I kick Lucy off Air Diamond that is one of the scenes that like is always in my head rent free elimination goes the next person that is out is Abdul which is Griffin's assistant and he gets flung into the pool um by Logan's booby trap scone setup and okay I haven't mentioned Abdul He's appeared in other episodes. It's just he just never has any speaking roles or anything like that. He's kind of just there beside Griffin. The adults realize that they are losing to the kids. And however, Kelly finds a loophole in the rule book. And so according to the rule book, no outsiders are allowed in this day of pranks, except for black ops, because black ops are deemed awesome. So the boys wrote that in as a joke, but because they didn't know anyone who could get black ops, except Griffin can get black ops. Um, I feel like black ops is such an old thing. Like, do kids nowadays know what that is? Like, I feel like that's a very dated reference, but that could also be me. Griffin hires a bunch of black ops to for this day of pranks. And so now for the elimination order, first is Jet, then it's Joe after she um, trips over a ladder. And then it's Camille who gets eliminated. The next person is almost Lucy, but James ends up saving Lucy from the Black Ops. And then Logan provides the group with confetti launchers to take the Black Ops down, and the boys perform the song Confetti Falling. Second time they perform the song, 
And it makes it to make so much sense for this scene. Yeah. So at the end of the song, they end up blasting Griffin with confetti. So now Griffin is out. And then Mrs. Knight and Gustavo go to Logan for pranks. However, pretty much the only pranks that Logan has are a bunch of blow darts because um, the rest of the kids cleared him out. And so Mrs. Knight and Gustavo decide to play on the bit boy's weaknesses instead. So as for elimination, Carlos gets out by a plastic sucker dart fired by Mrs. Knight. James gets hit in the fo- forehead with a sucker dart by Gustavo and while he's trying to save Lucy. And, th- and then Gustavo is out after Lucy uses her confetti launcher against him. So James and Lucy are about to have a moment when all of a sudden um, Mrs. Knight uses her confetti launcher and blasts Lucy. So now Lucy's out of the game. The only people left in the game are Kendall, Mrs. Knight, and Katie. Miss, Mrs. Knight decides to surrender against Kendall and Katie and tells them to both take her out at the same time. And so Kendall and Katie both pull their triggers. And at the last second, Mrs. Knight jumps into the air. And Kendall and Katie then blast each other, and both of them are out while Mrs. Knight does a high du- sky high split kick out of the way from them. So Mrs. Knight is now crowned as the winner of the Yee Day of Pranks, and she decides to start the countdown timer for the pranks next year. So the next episode we have is Big Time Rides, and I'm just gonna say this again: the second half of like the, these seasons usually go kind of downhill like the writers kind of just don't know what to do because they can't add any new things to the plot and they can't also like create you know they can't create new storylines and all that because they have a show you know they have a season to tie up by the end of it this is big time rides so pretty much outside of the palm woods one day the boys see that a motorcycle is for sale and they all pretty much fantasize about riding this motorcycle but mrs knight threatens to kill the boys if any of them decide to buy the motorcycle lucy sees james with the motorcycle and she thinks that james bought the motorcycle and she accepts that she will go on a date with james if she can ride this motorcycle so james decides to buy this motorcycle and katie learns that he bought it and she tells him that her mom is going to kill him and james pretty much enlists katie to help him figure out how to ride this motorcycle before his date with lucy so throughout this episode james is trying to learn how to ride this motorcycle and makes excuses to lucy as to why he can't take her on a ride just yet and so at the end of the episode james ends up riding the motorcycle into the apartment and lucy calls off their date and after learning james can't ride this motorcycle in joe and kendall's plot pretty much joe asks kendall to help her teach her how to drive a stick because she needs to know for the new danica patrick movie that she wants to star in and so kendall refuses because he says that they always fight when they try to teach each other different things he eventually gives in and they steal gustavo's porsche and kendall is also nervous that gustavo will learn that they stole his car if they get a scratch on it so during this driving lesson Joe and Kendall constantly argue during the lesson and it ends up getting out of hand and their car accidentally backs up. Kendall tells Joe that they need to break up but misinterprets it as a break up. So they break up and they decide to become just friends instead and they try to go do another driving lesson. In the end, they patch things up, they rekindle their relationship and now Joe is able to master the stick shift. In Carlos and Logan's plot, they pretty much recover their old wagon from Minnesota and they play around with it much to Gustavo's dismay. Gustavo forces them to give up this wagon, but they refuse as it's been part of their childhood. And so Kelly helps Carlos and Logan upgrade their wagon so they can make they can use it and make it faster or whatever. I don't know. I don't care about this plot that much. At the end of the episode, the wagon ends up getting destroyed by Gustavo's car while Kendo and Joe are on their driving lesson. And Gustavo learns that Kendall was using his car and Gustavo ends up chasing Kendall um, at the end of the episode. The next episode we have is Big Time Tess. Logan is planning on taking the MCAT and needs all of the good energy available. Meanwhile, James learns that Lucy left for a European tour and to cope with his feelings, he becomes obsessed with taking relationship quizzes to prove that he would be a good boyfriend for Lucy. So he pretty much 
makes Kendall do a relationship quiz with him, but then is offended by all of the answers Kendall is giving him, which causes James to break up with Kendall. James then tries to prove to Kendall that he is a better boyfriend than Kendall gives him credit for, and then makes Kendall take a friendship test with him. Kendall agrees, but then starts to get all of the answers wrong, which upsets James even more. Kendall then talks to James again about their friendship and pretty much patches things up with him at the end. And then we get to the B plot, which Katie, Gustavo, and Kelly are forced to test out Griffin's latest products from the RCM CBT Global Net Sanyoid Corporation. For today's finicky tweens, the modern working woman, and anyone who wants to lose 20% of their body size. Back in Logan's plot, so Logan brings Carlos to the MCAT test as his good luck charm. However, Carlos ends up getting a perfect score on the MCAT, which causes Logan's dreams of becoming a doctor to be crushed. And so throughout this episode, Carlos is showing off his medical skills and tries to impress everyone at the Palmwoods while Logan decides to pursue a different career. So Logan decides to become a hotel manager underneath the mentorship of bidders and everyone is concerned about him. Carlos then tells Logan that corn dogs are the answer to everything because that's what he wrote on his Scantron to get 100% on the test, which reveals that for the whole test, Carlos just guessed the answers. This convinces Logan to retake the test again. And yeah, that's how the episode ends. The next episode we have is Big Time Cartoon. So pretty much at the beginning of this episode, Gustavo and Kelly tell the boys that they have good news. So either the boys have a choice of creating a video game or a cartoon about themselves. So they decide to go with the cartoon option first, but they end up not liking the idea that is pitched. And yes, that is Mr. Carrie Dubeck from the show The Other Two. And fun fact, he is Caitlin Tarver's actual real life brother. So Caitlin Tarver is the one who plays Joe on Big Time Rush. They're related. The boys opt to do the video game. However, they are forced to wear these green motion capture suits. So the boys accidentally get locked out of rock records and are forced to roam the streets in these suits. And there's pretty much a whole plot in this episode where people think that they're aliens and this government or something is trying to capture them by chasing them around the city and so the guys finally find a dumpster full of clothes and change out of their suits and then they realize that the cartoon may not be such a bad idea after all and they decide to go to talk to the executives again in the b plot for this episode katie is watching the fairly odd parents while buddha bob is repairing a light and light bulb in their apartment And after falling off his ladder, he ends up transforming into Cosmo. So as a result, Mrs. Knight ends up wishing for things and Buddha Bob begins to grant them. And then after going to Dr. Hollywood, Dr. Hollywood fixes Buddha Bob and he's back to normal. They literally just did did this plot to fill up time. And the actor who plays Buddha Bob literally voices Cosmo on the Fairly Odd Parents, so they just needed to use that somewhere. So they used it for this episode. So that is this is literally the first half of the episode. And then finally, the second half of the episode is the actual cartoon. So the boys have come up with an interesting plot for their cartoon. So the cartoon starts off with the boys on their tour plane. However, the pilot loses control of the plane and they land on this deserted island only to be captured by monsters called Lizardians. So the Lizardians are pretty much planning to turn all humans into apes by putting them in this transporter thingy, but they accidentally turn James into a donkey in the process, and they're pretty much locked up. Carlos's pet pig, Snort Snort, breaks them out because Carlos has a pet pig in this cartoon. The boys manage to get out of their cell and they fight the Lizardians and they perform their song Song For You one of my favorite songs off of the 24-7 album a certified bop the album version features the duo Carmen very 2013 reference isn't they pretty girls all over but they got nothing on you moving all around the world and no one gets me like the way you do baby I thought that you should know none of the rest who even goes feeling pretty girls all over but they know this song's for you and yeah at the end of the episode big time rush defeat the Lizardians and turn them into squirrels and they make it to their concert on time after they turn themselves into pterodactyls using the transporter machine so that is big time cartoon um as to why this whole episode isn't a cartoon 
I don't know, maybe it was just time constraints or whatever. But when it was marketed on Nickelodeon at the time, it was literally like they pretended like this whole episode was just going to be a cartoon. And it didn't end up that way. And I was very disappointed because the first half of this episode is literally atrocious. So anyways, the second half really saves it. So the next episode we have is Big Time Breakout. In this episode, the boys are celebrating the release of their third album titled Get Up in this show. And pretty much at the party, Griffin tells the boys that pretty much every boy band splits up after their third album. And that is usually when a member breaks out. They make a reference to Harry Styles possibly breaking out of One Direction. Kendall is not happy with the ideas the others begin to pursue for their new careers. So Carlos has his heart set on becoming a big Broadway star. Logan wants to start a career as a game show host. And James wants to be a solo artist and is already coming up with ideas for his own solo album titles. Meanwhile, Katie is preparing to break her voting record from last year for the Tween Choice Awards, which will come up later. And pretty much Gustavo and Kelly want Kendall to record a solo album, but he refuses to do so. Kendall first tries to convince Logan and Carlos not to break out, but he is unsuccessful after he loses one of Logan's game show games. And Carlos gets recruited by a Broadway casting director to audition for her her new musical. Kendall then goes and tries to convince James not to break out, but James is already in their apartment brainstorming ideas for his solo album. James Diamond, I'm not in big time rush anymore because I broke out. James Diamond leaning against a cement wall and James Diamond breakout dreams. So Griffin decides that James is going to be the member that breaks out of big time rush and so kendall goes back to the studio to record his solo album with gustavo and kelly however he realizes that it's just not the same when he's the only one singing so he tries to convince kelly and gustavo to give him two hours to retrieve the rest of the guys and so he gets straight to work on that kendall successfully convinces logan not to break out through a game of pictionary and they then go crash carlos's audition to convince carlos not to break out And so pretty much the boys tell Kendall that they only decided to break out because they thought they were all going to do it and they didn't want to be the the one left behind. The boys then try to come up with a plan to get James back, but James ends up showing up at the studio and tells them that he didn't want to actually break out. He just thought the rest of them were going to and he didn't want to be left behind as well. So then... Griffin comes to Rock Records and asks them which is one of them is going to be the breakout star, and they tell him that none of them are. So the guys want to stay together as a group, so they challenge Griffin to a game show competition called Big Time Rush's Super Mega Ultimate Game Show. They pretty much convince Griffin to be part of this game show, and they pretty much play games that are similar to the Wheel of Fortune, Jeopardy!, survivor and wipe out but it turns out that kendall logan gustavo and james are downright terrible at games and so griffin easily wins each round griffin ends up with four points but he decides to give big time rush five best friend points when katie shows griffin that big time rush has been nominated for five categories at the tween choice awards and they pretty much win the game show and griffin says to big time rush that he wants them to perform at the tween choice awards and they accept it so that is the penultimate episode of season four which is big time breakout now we have made it to the season four finale which is Big Time Dreams. This series finale is the season's hour-long special. Apparently, this episode took about two weeks to film, so I guess that they were filming it simultaneously with the previous other episodes that we see. And this episode is so similar, just like to the Big Time movie, just based off of plot points and all that, which like, because they both contain like spy elements and a dream plot point and all that. But yeah, The actual big time movie that was never referenced in this episode at all, we can just collectively forget about that movie altogether. The boys are invited to the 24th Tween Choice Awards, which is hosted by Nick Cannon. And this is obviously a parody of both the Kids Choice Awards and the Teen Choice Awards. Um for copyright reasons. So the Purple Rocket is a parody of the Orange Blimp used at the 
Kids Choice Awards, which was a really big deal like a couple years ago. You know, it's like back when this show was airing, the Kids Choice Awards was an insane deal. Like it was such like award shows were much more popular back then and much more of like cultural moments rather than they how they are now. Like it's like the I don't even know if the Kids Choice Awards even exist now. I think they do, but it's just like not on the same level as like they were like years prior, you know? So Big Time Rush are at their soundtrack for this award show. Gustavo and Kelly appear and pretty much give them a pep talk. And Gustavo tells them that all of their dreams are going to come true tonight with this show. And pretty much the boys recount what their dreams are for the night of the Tween Choice Awards. Carlos wants a girlfriend. Logan wants to figure out where they keep the purple goop. And James wants to kiss Lucy. Kendall is the only one that doesn't share his dream because he tells them that something always bad happens when they do an hour-long special and the boys think that Ke- Kendall is just dreamless. Um, the boys then start their sound check and sing their song, Get Up. So also, this is the last time we will see the um, Rock Records recording booth and all that. I think during this time, they took down the rest of the sets. That's the last time you'll see it. Also, Purple Goop is a parody of the Green Slime at the Kids' Choice Awards. And I know Gwyneth Paltrow is shaking in her boots right now. So the boys then record a commercial for Sharky's Mac and Cheese, which is supposed to be airing during the award show. And pretty much the QR codes that they are holding is supposed to announce a special winner of the Sharky Mac and Cheese contest. The boys then meet Martin Sharkis, which is the CEO of Sharky's Mac and Cheese. And Griffin tells them that he is the number one CEO in the world. And that makes Griffin very mad. After the commercial shoot, the boys return back to the palm woods and they run into joe and camille who are practicing um for the award show since they are presenters and they need to get used to walking in heels and then the it turns out that the jennifers are back to the palm woods after disappearing for almost an entire season and the jennifers pretty much tell carlos that they came back for him and they tell him that he needs to pick one of them to be his girlfriend. It is now the day of the Tween Choice Awards, and it is Purple Carpet carpet time. So the Purple Carpet is being hosted by actress Ryan Newman. Um, She was on the show See Dad Run with Scott Baio, so that was the show that aired on Nick at Night, and I think James Maslow was also on the show when he played like her boyfriend or something. Lucy shows up to the carpet and because she is nominated for a couple of awards. And so James crashes her interview and she and James is still mad that he she left for Europe and didn't say goodbye. And so Lucy leaves the interview annoyed and James is annoyed at her. And then Ryan just interviews Big Time Rush. Meanwhile, in the B plot, Mrs. Knight inadvertently washes their VIP passes to the Tween Choice Awards, which melts them and causes Katie not be able to meet Austin Mahone, which is her celebrity crush. And so Mrs. Knight decides to turn their apartment into a personalized VIP room to watch the Tween Choice Awards alongside Mr. Bitters, Buddha Bob, Jet Stetson, and um and the other residents at the Palmwoods. Because remember, Katie never gets a friend her age at all throughout this entire show. So this is who she, this is the crew she has to hang out with. So yeah, the award show is about to start and we see Austin Mahone here and we also see Miss Alexa Vega. And the only reason why Alexa Vega is in this episode is because she um, was dating Carlos at the time and now they're married. Now they have kids. Now they're, you know, they're happily married and all of that. But yeah, throughout this whole episode, they just make references to her being in Spy Kids because that's the only like piece of content that, you know, kids like watching the show would recognize her from. So they're just constantly making spy kids references and jokes and all of that. So the boys pretty much promise each other that they are going to make their dreams come true tonight. And so the first dream that they work on is Carlos and they pretty much try to help him pick a Jennifer and they push him toward the Jennifers and tell him that the first girl that catches him will be his girlfriend. But the first girl that catches him, however, is Alexa Vega, and she quickly disappears before Carlos can say anything to her. Big Time Rush are then up for the first award, which is presented by Joe and Camille. However, they lose the award to One Direction, and Joe and Camille get gooped. The boys then go backstage to find Sharky the shark staring creepily at them. Meanwhile, Griffin and Gustavo come out of the tent, um, inhaling bowls of mac and cheese, and the guys are kind of like, 
that's suspicious. That's weird, but let's not think about that. So the boys then go back to their seats as they're up for another award, and that is presented by Mindless Behavior, who also get gooped. Um, And James sees Lucy in the audience, and he tries to talk to her, but they are caught on camera. The boys then decide to work on Logan's dream for the night and help that come true. So they head into the basement to see where they keep the purple goop, but instead they find Martin Sharkus's evil headquarters, And, like, does this not look like Moon's headquarters? The only main difference between Sharkus and Moon is that Sharkus wears a yellow um, suit and Moon wears a white suit. The boys eventually end up escaping, and in good old Big Time Rush fashion, there's a whole running sequence away from the bad guys. And they end up running into a room in the basement where they find where the purple goop is stored. However, Martin Sharkus's goons find them, but they are quickly knocked out by this invisible force. So this force ends up turning out to be Alexa Vega, who reveals that she is a real-life spy, and she has a device that lets her turn invisible. And pretty much she is at the award show to take down Sharkus. And the boys realize that they are missing an award that James is up for. The award is presented by pop duo Carmen. And they present the award for awesomest hair, which James is up for and James loses it. Meanwhile, Mrs. Knight is still trying to make the VIP room at the Palmwoods Fun, but Katie is still upset. Now the boys are working on making James's dream come true. And so they pretty much persuade Austin Mahone, who is up to present an award with Lucy, to let James um, present the award with Lucy instead. Austin says yes, and so James runs to the stage to talk to Lucy and present the award with her. James and Lucy end up getting into a brief argument on stage, but then she reveals that she actually came back for James, and the two finally kiss. The Jennifers then confront Carlos about which one he's decided he will date, and then Alexa reveals herself to Carlos and says that she has a crush on him since BTR was formed, and pretty much the two of them kiss, and the Jennifers then leave to look for One Direction instead. The boys then help Alexa find Sharkus, only for them to get caught by his goons, and they get trapped in this cell with a giant cheese block that's designed to crush them. They eventually escape, and then they escape um, just in time for the next award, in which they lose to Justin Bieber. And then back at the Palmwoods, Katie apologizes to Mrs. Knight about her behavior, and she says that she knows her mom was just trying to make her happy. And BTR learned that Sharkus's plot was to use the end of their mac and cheese commercial to brainwash the audience. Thanks to Alexa, the boys end his plans by spraying all the purple goop on the controls, and everything gets destroyed. And because Big Time Rush were so busy trying to save the world, and take down Sharkus, they forgot they were up for an award in which they actually win. So then they finally get to the stage to get their purple blimp for Awesomest Song, and they celebrate with joy and they accept their award. And pretty much Kendall reveals that his dream was to actually perform at the award show with his three best friends and is happy that his dream came true. And they close the award show with the performance of their song, We Are. And I literally cannot listen to We Are like to this day without thinking about this episode because it's so nostalgic. Their performance is accompanied by highlights of the show and all that and clips and all that. It is very cute. And that is the reason why I can't listen to the song to this day because like I always just think about the ending of the show and all of that. And yeah, so at the end of the episode, the boys pretty much host an after party at the Palmwoods and Katie's dream finally comes true after the boys invite Austin Mahone to this party. And so, yeah, she finally gets to meet him. The boys then celebrate at the after party with their dates, Lucy, Joe, Camille, and Alexa. And pretty much they, alongside the other Palmwoods residents, end the night by celebrating with Gustavo, who's DJing, and they play the Big Time Rush theme song. So that is the ending of the episode. And that is the series finale. And I think the ending of the episode really saves the episode itself. Because I remember watching this episode, and when it aired, I just wasn't really that impressed with it. Because I just hated that all the characters were so split up throughout this whole episode like i really thought there would be more plots with the boys and katie and mrs knight and gustavo and kelly and all that but it just wasn't like that like i thought we would just have more plots with the characters we already know and love but no like we had to add new lore to this whole thing and yeah so this is a series of big time this is a series finale big time rush and 
It's mostly due to the fact that um, after the third season, they had a really big decline in ratings and all of that. And also, I think the show was just ready to come to an end. The boys were getting older and also severely overworked and they were ready for a break. And also, like, I don't think this show did a great job at growing with its audience. Like, it stays consistent with the eight to, you know, 11 year old, 13 year old, like, boy humor sort of thing but it's like you could just feel that the writers were kind of running out of ideas like this whole plot for the finale is practically the big time movie plot i think there were talks about them doing a fifth season if they had like a resurgence of views but like in reality i think everyone was kind of ready for the show to come to an end and yeah that is big time rush as a series and i believe my storage face is running up so i will come back to you later and we will talk about the season four songs, the concert tours, as well as Big Time Rush's hiatus and what they are planning on doing now. Now that we've concluded the series finale of the TV show, now let's talk about the season four songs um, that were played during the show. So all the songs that were performed in season four of Big Time Rush were included on Big Time Rush's 24-7 album. And that is their third studio album. And it was released on June 7th, 2013. And it was released through Columbia Records. I don't believe this album is as popular as their previous, like their previous two albums. However, in this for this album the group contributed more to the writing of pretty much most of the songs that appear on this album and pretty much after their elevate album the members of the band they were like you know what like maybe we should actually start taking this music thing like even more seriously so they wanted more creative control on their 24 7 album because of that the group had a lot more contribution in the writing process and it got to the point where they were like writing and producing songs. I believe that like they had recorded about like 40 to 50 songs and they pretty much had to weed out their favorite ones out of the 40 to 50 songs to put on this album. The majority of songs that were written on this album were by Big Time Rush and I feel like that also explains why... So many songs from this album got leaked before the release. Like, you can find so many of their unreleased songs just on the internet. I was like, why are why were so many of these songs leaked online before the official release? And then I'm like, you know, it was like, was it a marketing ploy? And I'm just like, you know what? It was probably by like the band members and songs. It was probably Kendall. Like, Kendall probably leaked all the songs <laughs> on Tumblr. The four members pretty much co-wrote 13 songs. And that includes the five songs that are on the deluxe album. And pretty much, yeah, it was, this was the last album they released before going hiatus in 2014. In contrast with their past releases, the songs were primarily written by the band, except for two songs on the album, the songs Like Nobody's Around and Song For You. And ironically, those two songs are my favorite songs on the album. So no like hate to Big Time Rush because they were probably involved in that process still a lot. It it just turns out that Like Nobody's Around and Song For You are my favorite songs. So yeah, let's get into the season four songs. And again, because the group had more creative control for this album, they spilled a lot of tea in past interviews, current er interviews, even about the songs and sort of like what happened surrounding this album. So I'm here to tell you the tea because I think that's what most of you guys are here for. Let's go through which songs were played. So the song 24 seven, which was one of the songs they chose as a single, I believe um, was played one time, like nobody's around one time, get up one time song for you featuring Carmen one time run wild two times crazy for you one time Picture This, One Time, Confetti Falling, Two Times, Amazing, Zero, We Are, One Time, Love Me Again, Zero, Just Getting Started, Zero, Untouchable, One Time, Lost in Love, Zero Times, Na Na Na, Zero. So yeah, it's like for the most part, they try to perform at least each of the songs one time. And the only ones that, you know, weren't performed much were the deluxe albums, and then amazing. So let me just tell you the tea about each of, not all of the songs, but like specific songs. Okay, so Song For You featuring Carmen. So 
somehow Big Time Rush and Carmen ended up, you know, meeting each other and they wanted to collab on a song. So pretty much for the official version, the rap part is actually different than what they were going to plan for the song because I guess the pop duo Carmen, they wrote and recorded pretty much one version for the feature, but then they submitted it to Columbia Records and they were like, um, we are going in a different direction. Can you try this again? And so pretty much they had to re-record their parts, rewrite everything, and then they pretty much used that in the final version. So I believe that the original lyrics referenced like some of the song lyrics to Worldwide, but pretty much Columbia just didn't like it. And they were like, try again. The next one, Crazy For You. Crazy For You was actually going to be put on the band's second album, Elevate. But then the band was kind of like, "Mm, we like some other tracks more. So we're going to put those on. And then Crazy For You um, sort of, they left it. And then when they were coming around to this album, they decided to put it on. So, I mean, I, I understand that. Another song that fell into that category as well was Confetti Falling. So Confetti Falling was written and recorded in 2011. And it was when they were also writing Elevate and all. They said like it was one of their favorite songs. It's just it didn't fit with the Elevate album, which makes sense because the Elevate album is like is a pretty different tone from this one. Since it didn't fit in with the others, they had to take it out and then they put it on this one as well. Next, we have the song Amazing. Amazing is one of my favorite songs on this album. And it's a shame that they never performed it um, l- like on the show they've performed it live um no they have they never performed it on the show which criminal to me but pretty much around this time when big time rush were writing songs on the album it's like they would have been in their early 20s right and so because of that they i think they were trying to go for a bit more of a mature sound as well as more mature lyrics but nickelodeon being nickelodeon they're like uh no way like we're not gonna do that and so pretty much according to james maslow who helped write the song amazing for one of the lyrics nickelodeon made him change a lyric in the song so there's a lyric that says this is just unreal and he wanted to put got that sex appeal we are um there's no b there, there's no t behind it this is just like the final song that they perform in the series that's it okay love me again this is where the t is piping hot all right so like i said during this time nickelodeon they were very strict on what you know what themes could be in the music that uh big time rush released on april 17th Carlos uploaded a video on their YouTube channel that um, the band pretty much recorded when they were in Brazil for their tour. And pretty much the video just is just a single shot like video of the band members fooling around in their hotel, um, dancing and lip syncing to the song Love Me Again. And mind you, the song was not released then or anything like that. Nobody knew what the song Love Me Again was. And pretty much he captioned the video with, um, boys, let me know if you approve. I'll save it. Then when the album gets released in June, good times to come this summer. The video was uploaded. Everyone was confused because Love Me Again had not been released yet. The album had not been released yet. And pretty much like, or like the album wasn't even announced yet. And pretty much based off of like, the video description it suggested that carlos like may have accidentally made this video public and all of that however when it's like intended to be private and all that on his social media like this video the band they're like thrusting and all that they're they're making some pretty suggestive dance moves that were very i wouldn't say baffling but very like surprising back in 2013 and so like yeah, the movements were a bit more mature and all that and very much atypical to the big time rush everyone sort of knew from Nickelodeon. The video is still up on Carlos's channel. If you want to check it out, like go ahead. That YouTube channel, I swear, has like has had 10 different lives. It's crazy. But yeah, um, then on 
April 29th, Big Time Rush pretty much announced that Love Me Again would be included on the track list for 24-7. When the album was released, however, the fans realized that the lyrics had been largely rewritten and pretty much a lot of the sexual themes that were released in the leaked video version um, were replaced and pretty much it became a song about just like like you know a breakup and a loss and heartbreak and over that over like a failed relationship it was confirmed by carlos in like one of the interviews i had with zach saying was that they purposely released the video for love me again because they were mad that nickelodeon wanted them to rewrite all of the lyrics and all that for their song that was kind of like their stance against it so that's why like they released the video and they wanted to see like the fans reaction to it and all of that were nick Nickelodeon happy about that? Absolutely not. What's so ironic about the situation, though, is that Big Time Rush was a show about rebellious teenagers and all of that. And Nickelodeon then gets surprised when the band that they hired becomes rebellious when it comes to their music. Like, I'm just like, why is that surprising to you? The actual, like, lyrics um, for the original Love Me Again. Two girls at the door and they all want to roll, want to roll, but I got to say no. One girl that I'm looking for, there, there she go. I knew you'd be back for another round. Give me a chance to lay it down. The night is young. We having fun. Show me love. Hit me up. You're so beautiful. When we dance, heaven opens up. Girl, I just thought that I should let you know. Baby, when the night is done, I'll let you go. But promise you'll be back for more. I want to touch you like I did before. So baby, take my hand, take my hand. I'm going to make you love me again. Tell me what you like on the floor, on the floor all night. What you want to do, baby girl, it's up to you, up, up to you. And I knew you'd be back for another round. The way that you move it just knocks me down. Um, same lyrics, same lyrics, same lyrics. And yeah, like hearing that, I'm just like, you know, like the lyrics aren't like that sexual either. Like the first bit, yes. Like I do see why Nickelodeon want to change that. But like the rest of it, I was like, I think you could have just slid with it and like it would have been fine. Like nowadays, like everyone's kind of done everything. So it's like them, if they release this, you know, if they were still on Nickelodeon to this day and they release this now, like no one would bat an eye. But back in 2013, I don't know. I guess they really needed that clean cut image. Um, But anyways, and it's also like, it's not like, Big Time Rush have a lot of like suggestive songs either. Like Carlos is a Christian man, okay? Like Mr. Carlos is a Christian man. Like he has to save room for Jesus, all right? That is like this whole tea surrounding Love Me Again, pretty much. Nickelodeon wanted to change the lyrics. The boys were not happy. They leaked the song. They released a whole video about it. It was it was a whole thing. Also, apparently they re-recorded this song in 2022 from what I've heard. And so it could be possible that they could be re-releasing it or something. I don't know, but yeah. Um, all these ones, I'm pretty sure most of these songs also got leaked online. Like there's like a pretty good chance. Most of these songs on the album were the ones that got leaked online. So yeah, that is a tea surrounding the 24 seven album. I mean, I think there are a lot of underrated songs that are on this album. And I think a lot of them are underrated because Nickelodeon did not give this album any promotion compared to their other two. Like, obviously, their first album, that's when, like, they hit it super big. You know, Nickelodeon did nothing to sort of back their album up other than, like, you know, send them on tours and all that. But then it's like you could kind of tell that Big Time Rush was starting to lose their popularity around the time that this album was coming out and all that. So I think that's also another reason why like they went on hiatus. It was kind of like they were trying to figure out like what they were going to do like after the show ended and all that. So yeah, that is a 24 seven album. Go listen to it. Um, There are a lot of good songs on here. A lot of songs that I still listen to to this day. So yeah. So the next thing we are going to talk about is Big Time Rush's concert tours um, after pretty much from the third to fourth season i guess the first tour that they went on was the big time summer tour the first tour that they went on after after i believe filming season three or something it was the big time summer tour and that was july 5th 2012 to october 11th 2012 
And yeah, so this was their third concert tour, and it pretty much marked the first official world tour by Big Time Rush. So they visited both Americas, North America, South America, and it supported their um, second studio album, Elevate, and their big time movie soundtrack. So the Beatles covers. And apparently, according to Ticketmaster, it was the the second best selling tour um, in the summer of 2012. So very interesting. For this tour, they actually went to my city um, for a concert, which surprised me because nobody ever comes to my city. I didn't go to the concert because I don't think I was into BTR like that at the time. Um, But to be fair, I would have been 11 years old when this happened, and I probably would have no recollection of it either. So anyways, they toured with Cody Simpson. I love Cody Simpson, you guys. Rachel Crow, who was on season three of Big Time Rush. Um, Leon Thomas III. So he plays Andre from Victoria's. That would have been a great like concert, to be quite honest. Um, and then Canada, he toured. They toured with Tyler Medeiros and Victoria Duffield. And if you're not Canadian, those names don't mean anything to you. But as a Canadian girly myself, oh, like those the music made by those two, they were forced down your throats as a kid. Like if you went onto Family Channel anytime as a kid, you would either be watching a Tyler Medeiros music video or a Victoria Duffield video during the commercial breaks. All right, like. Their music was shoved down your throat, but at the same time, their music was so good that like you couldn't even complain about it. So that just like gave me f- such flashbacks to when I was like 11 years old watching Family Channel. Um, and then they they toured with other people that I have no idea who they are, so I'm not going to talk about them. But yeah, that was the big time summer tour. I think that was like one of their biggest tours that they've done. Like. Um, now I do kind of wish I went to that tour, but whatever, like that was like more than 10 years ago. So I missed my chance for that. The next tour that they went on after filming season four, it was, it was their summer break tour. And this was the co-headlining tour by Big Time Rush and Victoria Justice. Um, pretty much this tour supported the 24-7 album and then um, Victoria Justice's music from Victorious. Remember, around this time, there was a lot of drama around the Victorious cast and all that with Victoria Justice. For this tour, I guess they played 40 shows just in North America. I think it was just the US. I'm not sure. This tour was actually originally meant to just be headlined by Big Time Rush, but then like Victoria Justice, she was planning on going on her own tour itself. I don't think she sold out enough shows, so then they just combined the two shows together um, and said that, like, yeah, she's just going to co-headline with Big Time Rush instead. So that was a summer break tour. That was sort of, yeah, the tour that they went on um, to support, like, the, the last season of Big Time Rush and their third album. Finally, the last tour they went on was the Live World Tour, which was from the month of February in 2014. And I genuinely don't remember them going on this tour. (laughs) I think after Big Time Rush, the TV show ended, I think, you know, they went, um, you know, they went on their summer break tour and then they kind of just like had a little bit of a hiatus and then they decided to go on another world tour. And then I, I don't know, like, I don't remember this tour happening at all. And, um... I don't think they did either because what is this poster? The live world tour was, yeah, the last world tour that they went on before their official hiatus. Now let's talk about Big Time Rush's hiatus. So after they released the 24-7 album in 2013, Nickelodeon obviously did not renew Big Time Rush, you know, for another season. And there was just a lot of things involved as to why Nickelodeon didn't, you know, renew the show and all that. But... I think at that time, after they didn't get renewed, it was kind of like Nickelodeon and also like Big Time Rush, the creator, like no one really knew what to do because the nature of the Big Time Rush brand, you know, it was entwined with so many different things. So it was like there was the music that was released by them, but then that also coincided with the airing and the production of the show. And so pretty much like after the show ended, everyone was kind of just speculating that they're like, oh, Big Time Rush is probably going to disband after the show ends. Because, you know, originally the boys were just hired 
as actors. They were hired as actors to create the show and then they ended up releasing music and records and all that on the side, right? But originally they were just hired actors to create this thing. I don't think Nickelodeon expected for them to be so into the music and the writing and, you know, actually like being part of creating this whole brand and this band and all of that stuff. Most people were speculating that it's like, oh, Big Time Rush are going to disband. They're going to break up, you know, but then Big Time Rush, they're like, like, no, like we're not parting ways or anything. Like they were like, we're going to continue touring. And then they were also like, we also have interest in releasing more albums in the future and all of that, which makes sense because, you know, if you're going to commit like five you know, plus years to a specific brand that you've helped create, you know, it like, and you work well with the people and you, you know, you're, you find success from it. Like, I, I understand why you would want to keep going. February, 2014, that was the live world tour they went on. And then after that, they didn't announce anything. They didn't announce like what they were doing, if they had any plans and all that. And so, because of that, the media started reporting that the band was like on this indefinite hiatus and the band was like, yes, like we are on a hiatus, but we're not broken up or anything. Like we're each going to sort of do our own individual projects, but we will reunite sometime in the late future, you know? And so pretty much like they had this whole stance for like the next couple years of like inactivity and all of that around that time as well. It was like, Big Time Rush, they were kind of growing out of their Nickelodeon image. And at the same time, their fans were as well. So it's like most of Big Time Rush fans were probably around my age at the time. You know, it's like you started watching the show when you were probably around 8 to 11 years old, right? And then by the time the show finishes, you're around like the 13, 14 year old mark, right? And so it's like you're wanting to watch more mature things. You want you want to watch more mature content and all that. And so you kind of end up not growing up with the same content that, you know, you watched as a kid. And so it's like I remember after the show ended, I quickly found new interests, you know, as a kid. It was like like Big Time Rush was one of the last Nickelodeon shows that I personally watched. And then I immediately kind of went to like the ABC family shows. Like I was watching Pretty Little Liars. I was watching Teen Wolf. I was watching all of these different, you know, more adult teenager shows. And then at the same time, my music taste was different. Um, then it was like the only time I really saw a Big Time Rush was when they kind of just like appeared and it just felt like a little side quest. One year, I was really into watching Dancing with the Stars, like the Cody Simpson season. I was really into Dancing with the Stars because I was really into Cody Simpson. And then it turns out that James was also on that season. And so um, I just ended up watching that season because I was like, oh, Cody Simpson's here and James from Big Time Rush is here. Of course, I'll watch it. So like Big Time Rush members would kind of just pop up like randomly throughout the years. I never really like you know, followed the group and their social, like their solo, you know, kind of projects carefully, right? Like really closely. The four members were doing their own side quests for like the next around five years after the show ended and all that. So then in late 2019, Big Time Rush actually agreed to reunite and they really wanted to like publicize that they would return in 2020. But then obviously in 2020, we had a worldwide pandemic. So that pretty much forced them to delay their official announcement of reuniting as a band and all of that. And so like the timing just wasn't right. Like they were about to do it and then the world came crashing down. Somewhere in between their hiatus and all that, Big Time Rush had to purchase the rights to their name from a Nickelodeon and Sony Music and all that. Um and so after they kind of did that and they started to create their own business, they pretty much announced plans to reunite, release new music and, you know, resume touring and doing like concerts and all that. So from 2021 to 2023, they were mostly releasing just singles and all that. So um, this includes Not Giving You Up, Call It Like I See It, Fall, Honey, Dali Paya. 
and the their re-recorded version of Paralyzed. They also like held some small concerts and all that and tours just to see if they could, you know, sell out their concert tours and all that and they could, you know, find success in that, which they did. Their concerts get sold out so quickly now. And then they released their fourth studio album, which is called Another Life, and it was released June 2nd, 2023. I keep wanting to call this album Afterlife, but it is not Afterlife. It is Another Life. This is pretty much, this was like their first record after like, you know, a decade. They released a single titled Waves, and then they embarked on this North American Arena tour um, from June to August 2023. And then on October 24th, 2023, the band announced that they would be releasing a deluxe version of this album. So they released the deluxe version with more songs and all that. They're about to go on a tour in Europe this summer to promote this album in Europe. Also, when I was writing this script, um, I learned that Kendall just had his baby um, with his wife. God has a baby girl. He's a girl dad, you guys. He's a girl dad, and he named his baby Maple. Very cute. But okay, back to the Afterlife album. Anyway, so I highly suggest that, like, if you like any of their previous albums, go listen to this one because I guarantee you, like, if you like their old stuff, like, you'll like the music on this album. Um, it is really great. I've been listening to this album nonstop. It's my favorite songs on this album are "Can't Get Enough." I just want to party all the time. Weekends, both versions, the original and the acoustic version. Weekends is probably my favorite, favorite song on the album. Um, Superstitious, Learn to Love, Dream World, and Your Way. Like, those are my top picks. I love listening to them. Um, but yeah, uh, that is sort of what Big Time Rush has been up to. Um in regards to music. Now we are going to be talking about the possibility of them having a reboot and all of that. So I'm kind of glad I held out a bit to record this video because Carlos announced that they are planning on producing a big time rush movie. However, they didn't announce what kind of big time rush movie they were going to be producing so i have no idea if it's going to be a reboot um or like a continuation of you know their characters and what happened in the show and all that i don't know if it's going to be a whole new thing i don't know if it's going to be like a concert movie or whatever like there are many possibilities as to what big time movie could be that is not the big time movie that they have already but yeah Personally, for me, like just reboot wise and, um, you know, it's like continuing the series kind of thing. Like those characters, like I'm very indifferent about it. Like if they go that direction, I won't be mad. But if they don't go that direction either, I like won't be mad. Like if they go a different direction or like just not even make this movie at all. Like I'm not going to be mad either. Like I do think that, you know, their focus right now is music and they like to create music and they're very serious about it. So if that's what they want to do, like, then just do it, right? With the movies and all that, I believe Kendall said this in an interview. I was doing my research for this video, you guys, okay? Don't get me wrong. Um, one of the interviews um, Big Time Rush had, Kendall also brought up the, the, the point that, you know, it's like Big Time Rush, a TV show, gave credibility to Big Time Rush as a band. You know, it's like without the TV show, they wouldn't be a band themselves. But at the same time, if they were to do another kind of reboot of the show or, you know, whatever like that, they have to make sure that that show doesn't take credi credibility away from them. And so I think that's a really good point. Like, you know, it's like with those reboots, it can either go really good or not so good. So um, I think it would have to be very strategic and very like, you know, in tune with sort of what also other fans think of what this, what this movie or what these other pieces of media that they want to f make should be. And I do see why like they would want to do another like, you know, possible reboot and all that because again, like all these guys are actors. All of them have been acting since they were young. They probably miss acting and have the acting bug and sort of want to get back into that. So, you know, it's like, 
again, like I'm just a random person on the internet. I am very indifferent if they, you know, choose to go that direction and, you know, decide to do another reboot, make another movie, whatever, or if they want to do something completely different. Like I think, you know, the world is their oyster. They have so many possibilities. Um, they have a lot of loyal fans now. And so, yeah, um, that is all I have to say about Big Time Rush. This is the end of my video. If you watched this whole thing, if you watched both videos, if you liked what you watched, um, thank you so much for watching this video. I really appreciate it. And yeah, this is another unnecessary video about the TV show Big Time Rush. And I hope you learned a lot of stuff about the TV show and also just tea from the TV show and all of that. Um, I don't think I'll ever be talking about Big Time Rush on this channel again. So we are done with this chapter. And when one chapter ends, another one begins. And the next video I'm going to be making is we are changing the R in BTR to an S. We are finally going to be talking about BTS. This is a video I'm so excited to make. I haven't started planning it yet, but you will get news from me soon about what this video is going to be about. But yes, we are going from my love of BTR to my love of BTS. So please stay tuned for that video. Um, yeah, thank you for watching. This was a pretty long video and now I am dreading editing all of it. But thank you for watching and I'll see you in my next video. Bye.